any secretions which can hinder our vision in a e bus so i think we are going through a lma where once you go in this is where we'll ensure that the site where in which you are supposed to get get the lma fixed so that you can able to visualize the vocal cord i think we have dr arun also here actually i think he'll show on some light about what are the anesthesia and subsequently when i do please make check bronchoscopy this is a vocal cord think of a vocal cord what do you see usual principle is e bus and non e bus e bus we go with 45 degree 35 degree and 10 degree angulation here we have a bronchoscope we have a zero degree generally go with the post a cavity which is the widest get in that's the basics that's the basics of bronchoscopy now once you get in you can see the tracheal lumen with the tracheal cartilages with the posterior wall of the most of the smooth muscle so this is the level of carina so till carina there is no any sort of a major untoward stuff in his mucosal irregularity or any sort of a lesion now as we noted actually in the ct scan right is a pathology let us go to the left see the normal anatomy and then go to the right so on the left upper row i think i don't have to just enumerate what are the different segments for the augus cord actually which no each and every segment before we go for a bronchoscopy left apical posterior and anterior segment lingula superior and lingula and inferior lingula basic or superior left low lobe superior segment and your low lobe segments what is there except that media segment which is generated to miss on the left side there is no much of an endobronchial abnormality or any sort of a synoptic segment what we see in the left side Then subsequently, if you go back to the pathological side of the right side, tail carina is quite okay. And left upper lobe, I think probably once the left upper lobe, we are not able to see the sub segmental levels. Maybe because of the luminal compression, what we anticipated when we did a CT scan as a proper analysis. Right upper lobe, I think it's a boggy swelling actually without much of any endobronchial, but there is an extra luminal compression which is noted. at the same time how about the middle lobe middle lobe is also there is a, a significant amount of uh, narrowing which is noted maybe extra lobe is not there is no any endo bronchial obvious thing which is noted in this this is your b sec segment and this is your low lobe middle segment anterior anterior lateral and the posterior segment so conclusion each and every history we had a right um, mediastinal pathology There are also significant media signal reports with a probability of a right upper lobe and middle lobe luminal compromise. With check bronchoscopy, what we are ensuring the same thing what we are noted on the CT scan, the right upper lobe which is compromised, maybe extra luminal stuff. At the same time, we have a middle lobe also getting compromised and low lobe segment which is very much clearly demarcated. Okay. Then once we are done with the check bronchoscopy, I think our colleague from Olympus will get to know what are the different features of what the scope what we are using in this particular. scenario go ahead dipak so doctor is using a new therapeutic scope which, which has a 3 mm channel and it is compatible with our 4k processor and 4k monitor so our 4k processor has uh, two new uh, modes which is txi as well as rdi mode so the txi mode helps in better texture analysis and structure analysis which helps in better detection of the lesion and we have something called as rdi mode which helps in the identification what as well as Identification of the deeper red vessels in the submucous membrane. What he is telling is thanks, Deepak. That was a wonderful overview of bronchoscope, check bronchoscope, what we had done actually, and the instrument specification which is dealt with very nicely with Deepak. Now I'll hand over things to Dr. Arun to explain what sort of an anesthesia, or what are the things, so that our young colleagues will be better off in terms of understanding initial ten cases. I would like everybody to go through a general anesthesia rather than going to a sedation where the patient coughs. discomfort you also will be more panic mode actually to stick in a needle for somebody who is coughing who do you sir uh, good morning everybody uh, now as dr sunil said uh, ebus and bronchos initial bits of bronchoscopy is quite uh, difficult because the patient has to be compliant and having a patient compliant when you are uh, doing a bronchoscopy is an art uh, for for initially what we tend to do for most of the ebus we actually tend to give them general anesthesia now uh, again you have to realize all these patients are high risk patients they have got pay, uh, a chest pathology which you are investigating them for along with that they may have a cardiac pathology because obviously most of the chest diseases will produce some amount of cardiac pathology so you are looking at patients who got multiple comorbidities they are going under a procedure which is a bit risky which can make them hypoxic and hypercarbic 
So you have to take care in terms of how you manage these patients. So if it's a very fit patient for a diagnostic bronchoscopy, yes, under local or a bit of sedation is fine. But a sicker patient who's undergoing an EBUS, a prolonged procedure, which takes at least a good half an hour to do with good samples for you, uh, you probably are better off doing a general anesthesia. Now, the this is a shared airway. So the bronchoscopist and the anesthetist both have to realize that both of them have a part to play. And both of us have to actually communicate with each other if there is an issue. So that is something which has to be established. You cannot keep doing a scopy without caring about the patient going into bradycardia, uh, uh, hypoxia, and hypercarbia. At the same time, we need to give you an airway which is secure and where you can comfortably do a bronchoscopy rather than having to do a hurried bronchoscopy and you come out without adequate samples. So it's a shared airway. So the best thing which you can do for that patient is actually communicate. Communicate before you start the procedure on what you're going to do, how long it's going to take, and what's going to be done during the procedure. So that is what makes actually the, the whole process very smooth and easy. Now, we tend to anesthetize most of them under general anesthesia. We tend to give them something called as a total intravenous anesthesia. That's TIVA. Because we cannot give them an inhalational agent during the procedure. Because half the time, the scope is inside the bronchus. Gas escapes. And you can't give them a general anesthesia. So we tend to give them something called as a TIVA, which is an intravenous anesthesia. And along with that, we tend to monitor the depth of anesthesia so we can make out. Uh, I don't know if you can see it on the camera. Uh, as soon as trying to show it, if uh, let me just uh, so uh, I don't know if soon, uh, you're able to see, we've got something called as a BIS, which is basically the EEG to try and uh, capture uh, what is the depth of anesthesia for these patients under intravenous anesthesia, and you monitor that and make sure that the patient is fully asleep. You make sure that uh, the patient doesn't wake up during the pro uh, process. So you can monitor that. Right? Monitor the depth of anesthesia makes it easy to have them anesthetized and makes it easy to actually wake them up faster. Most of these patients are daycare procedures. So you need to get them awake as soon as possible so that you can discharge them. So monitoring the depth is uh, essential. Most of the anesthesia, almost everything is given intravenous. And you tend to keep them a fairly deep and occasionally paralyzed so that the bronchoscopy gets done faster, the procedure gets done faster. If you can do the procedure faster, you can discharge most of them as daycare, except the very high risk patients. So, uh, as I said earlier, the, the most essential thing is communication. If you communicate what you're going to do and what is the, the patient risk involved, you will get away with a, either deep sedation or an anesthesia in most of the cases. I think Sunil is ready now for his yeah. request. I'll hand uh, it back over to him. Yes, thank you, sir, for the comprehensive review. Basically, this is the best setup what I have it actually right now. The chief of anesthesia is there actually, best in airway to deal with all any sort of a troubleshooting. And we have a pathologist also lined up. And uh, we have a Arvind also there actually to guide me from Malaysia actually in terms of what best, what are tricks, what you can just get it up to get a good research actually. And hand over to Deepak also to just give a specification of the scope what we are having right now for the e bus. Hello, once again. So right now what we have is BFGC 1 and TF, the newer generation 1 and 2 e bus scope which has a outer diameter of 6.6 mm and the, the, the distal tip is shorter, which gives you a maximum field of view that is 80 degree. And it has a better angulation as well, which is of 150 degree compared to the previous scope, which had 120 degree. And you also have a balloon channel here. So this is the balloon channel and this is the instrument channel. So here it will be fixing your needle and we'll be doing your TDMA procedure. So right, thanks Deepak actually. Now I think you said actually, we have got a good anesthesia, good check bronchoscopy. We know what we are supposed to do with the elaborate anesthesia, how to get a sink actually so that we'll be clear with what we do. And at the same time, we have water scopes, water specification. We heard it just now from Deepak actually. Now we're going to go for a endobronchial assessment actually of patient actually going through LMA. I think now the vision also gets small, compromised actually. We have to depend upon a small uh, monitor actually, which will guide us. This is a vocal call. One more fundamental rules. When you want for e bus, if you go straight with zero degree, you will be getting into esophagus. Now, the issue is that we need to get into a more so that you can see only anterior chunk of a commissure. That's the way how you're supposed to negotiate your e bus scopes actually. Can I, can so I have the, 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 the Otherwise, you tend to give up. 
with endoscopic Once again, I'll read it on the young minds. Actually, this is the way how you are supposed to get into the EBUS and a conventional bronchoscopy. Conventional bronchoscopy, you go posterior aspect. Whether when it comes to EBUS, you go to anterior commissure so that you can sweep through because it comes with 35 degree angulation. You need to be very clear with the first point how to negotiate through the vocal cord. So now this is the way how slowly we go into negotiation to the posterior wall. Then ensure you are in the trachea. Now when it comes to going about the CT scan, what we generated to see for four, four hour lower paratracheal subcranial lymphoid, which was there on the CT scan, and also some hilar pathology also will be done. Ideally, initial understanding how to locate four R or lower paratracheal lymphoid. Go to the carina, touch your carina, come back. A one 1.5 centimeter, go for three o'clock. Three o'clock, you will be hitting a azagas vein. Just tilt at least one, at least to a 11 o'clock position, so to know whether there is any sort of a paratracheal lymphoid in this particular patient. Are there any comments of it? Sometimes I think they can make it. Able to see properly that you can dilate your balloons and then set a proper yeah. contact. This, this will be a great thing to do. Sometimes you can see the repopulation and see. Yeah, what do you describe? How do you describe about your limb flow actually? I think it, whatever the CT scan, I think what we're seeing is more of a calcified node, actually. Yeah, now, do you think it's a vessel or a sort of a hypotense lesion in the... This would be a better chunk of a lymph node, what we see. I think do we have an elosograph option, actually. One Doppler will guide us, actually. Doppler will guide us whether we are into a vessel to get a ABG or a VBG sample or to a lymph node, which is the area of interest, what we are want to get this thing sampled. Uh, we have Jeffrey and also Shazang also joining us actually to help me out to get the best of the best uh, result from this particular lymph node sampling. I think the details of the lymph node station landmark will be better dealt in the workstation actually. We'll go with the puncturing of this particular lymph node. Uh, a bit more of a vascular uh, lymph node, what we see in this. And a catch. Yeah. Now, lymph node one, size, what is the margin at the same time? A border at the same time, your central hilar structures, whether it's too much of sudden with vasculature. When you have a malignancy, the pre I think Dr. Vasa has done completely extensively about the lymph node. What are things to pick up when you do an EBUS? And what do you think about your pre actually, Arvin? Margin is very tough. Yeah. All uh, right. Can we go with this particular thing to go with the sampling? sampling yeah. We'll uh, demonstrate one or two samples actually, and then we'll uh, pass on to our uh, pathology colleagues actually to do what best can be done actually in terms of sampling of this particular lymph node. Yeah. Judge, yes, we'll go. Sampling, yeah, capillary pool method we generated to prefer for cap. Is a needle specification? Is a 21 gauge needle actually? What the camera gate is doing? What we are using is a new model which has a better functionality, better usability, and better access, and the better uh, visibility of the needle access. Thank you. Yeah. So basic housekeeping rules when it comes to endo image, you need to be in a position to see a tip of your sheet just beyond your endo luminal image. That is the basic housekeeping rules, otherwise you will tend to damage your scope most of the time. There is a small thing of it, you see that touch is one o'clock position, there is a small hub which comes out of the endo image. That is the way the sheet is around the show. Then I think this uh, lymph node has been served with multiple uh, vessels also. We will try to work out in such that we will not be hitting the vessels as far as possible. Another one, Dr. Sunil, I think when you insert the needle next to the it's a neutral position for so that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. That's the first thing and okay. foremost. Otherwise, you tend to damage your working channels, actually. Yeah. Basic rule. Till the time you see a tip of your sheet in the descent, you're not supposed to flex right. or extend, actually. Let it be in the neutral position so that it will not damage your scope. Okay. 
Uh, I think sir, there's some uh, issues with the LMA positioning actually. We'll just take some time actually to at least fix up that actually. Yeah, uh, Arvind, I think uh, going ahead actually, like how do you plan for this thing actually? I think uh, beside LMA, I think some centers in Malaysia they do use, they do EBUS under rigid bronchoscope yeah. as well. So the idea of rigid bronchoscope for general anesthesia is like patients are fully paralyzed. We have your control of the patient. Patient doesn't move with the respiration, you know, or move excessive movement are there to interfere with your sampling. But once you're comfortable, like of the sonial state, you can go with the conscious sedation yeah. under daycare. Yeah. Like in my center, I prefer to do under daycare because uh, limited. Right. Our OT slots are limited because of post COVID and current COVID situation and everything. So like right. after some time, definitely we can go under conscious sedation once you gain the sufficient confidence level. And then the, the beauty of general anesthesia and it's all pro and also the conscious, I mean conscious sedation, they have their own pro and cons like that. So in conscious sedation, patient might move, they might have a cough, reflex. You know, you have to know how to sedate properly, make sure patient doesn't have a cough, reflex or something. Right. So, then, so, so the idea of it, the whole thing is EBUS is actually, you try to go as fast as possible get the proper sample and come up. You don't want to delay unnecessarily. Right, right. So the planning is most important, like how I think Dr. Sri already mentioned where we are, our target lesion. I think Dr. Sri mentioned the, where the target lesion. That's how we have to go about it. Yeah, that's it actually. I think if you see that uh, global thing actually, in India we're comfortable with LA, just only thing is one cavity is upper paratracheal generally tend to get missed with a rigid bronchoscopy. But when it comes to Germany, they do everything in a rigid barrel. As compared to US also, they do a lot of uh, LMS as a yeah. thing actually for a uh, conduct to pass your e-buscopes to the airways. Ready to go, sir? Yep. Yeah, the same principle of how to approach the vocal cords actually. Yeah, uh, I think uh, Jera is ready to go actually. We are using a busy short uh, 21 jet lead actually to sample this particular lymph node. I think now uh, we got that image adequately on this particular stuff. We need to know from where the needle is going to arrive. I think uh, from now henceforth, I think Arvind will take over actually at this point of time actually in terms of how to sample this particular lymph node. What are the anatomical stuff? What you see on a monitor actually from where the needle comes? How you are supposed to get the sheath to the tip? I think, I think this tip is still not visible actually. The sheath tip. So when you, I think just focus on how Dr. Suni doing that. The green color thing is like sheath you can visible around one o'clock to close to one o'clock position. So just. A slight visible visibility is sufficient for us actually. So then again, Dr. Suni will navigate or ne negotiate until he can visualize the limb node where he want to take the sample. So because when you put in the neutral position, the location of limb node will disappear for a while. Yeah. Once you insert the needle and sheet is out, again you have to maneuver it through until you visualize the limb node where you want to take. And if you see the monitor, you can see a blue dot there. So that's where the, exactly the needle will come through. I think you can focus on that uh, blue dot, what you can see in the right uh, upper quadrant right of this upper particular. Quadrant, you can see the blue dot. So that's your needle. Angulation of your needle will come through there to enter your, puncture your yeah, limb node. The needle assembly, one, it will plunge with the suctioning channel where you're going to fix up that uh, attachment of a needle with that of a bronchoscope. And we have uh, two stopcocks actually to help us actually to regulate what is the length, what I'll be needing to sample this particular lymph node. If you use a two or bigger needle, probably we we'll, might need to know what is the size of the lymph node, what is there on the, can we mark this particular lymph node, Jairaj? This is a low, from the lower border actually, what is the, the Jairaj is measuring? Yeah. And the transfer diameter? The measurement is around, Thank you. 
four hours. I think we need to make sure the transfer diameter also. Right. I think what measurement? What fourteen? Fourteen? Yeah, what is the measurement? Less one. Ten point ten point six. So it's not that a huge note. What we are trying to target actually. The transfer diameter. When you want to. There's always an approximation issues. Most of the times you get to know anything encounter actually. Not to panic, stick to the basics, come into the airway, try to ensure that your carina is always visible actually so that to guide you which way we are bringing around actually. Yeah, are we, are, are, are ready to go on? Yes, ready to go in. I think so. I think you can visualize the limb not very clearly here. And you see the angle of the needle is going to come out on the blue dot. So it's just nice for you. So I think the person is answer uh, what's the length you are fixing it? How many? Three centimeters three is what centimeters. Is, Yeah. So doctor fully is fixing at three centimeters. Yeah. So Good. usually up to your operators, yeah. how, how what the length of needle you want to consider you can fix according to it later and yeah. show it in the needle. So one yeah. fix. Yeah, then I think the initial outstrip includes actually the stillet should be at least two to three millimeter away from the tip so that the endobronchial tissue, should, which is plunged into the distal tip, will be discarded once the movement of the stillet. This is the way the stillet is going to, I think you can see that the movement in the can also. At the same time, we go for what is called capillary pull technique actually, okay. where we, our technician will go to. Uh, so, capillary pull technique is where while we are taking a sample, the stillet will be pulled slowly. The slow pull method kind of thing. So there's another way of doing it that can apply the suction straight away. You are visible with. So usually how many contacts do you have? We generally three to four passes we generally go for each and every session. Yeah, we go for negative section also to at least get maximum tissue what can be acquired in the whole process. So this is the way they're applying the manual section, I mean uh, section method. It's a 20 cc syringe. I think you can see only the tip of the needle, which is jiggling around actually in the lymph node. So once you are in the lymph node, not necessary. Sometimes the yeah. needle might be blurred because of yes. the needle angulation. So don't get worried, but as long as you know you are in the position, shouldn't be a problem for you. I think they remove the needle. We are going to remove and block assembly of this lymph node actually. Uh, now we'll go to switch over to Dr. Tripti. She is a pathologist actually who will help us to know how to get smear this particular site. Hello, hello. Just one more person, then we we'll move to city seven. So maybe you want to tell them how we insert. Yeah, no. yeah, I think we step them. Yeah. Uh, on the morphology, do you think it's uh, size or adequate to do the place? Yes, thank you, Dr. Sipi. So now, just. Yeah. I think now, I think Dr. Sipi will show how to. Is there, uh, is there the size of the. Measures or steps to. 
remember the needle into the scope actually. Focus scope. So focus on the blocker scope in the needle infected point. Yeah. This is a section four six working channel through which uh, we are going to negotiate this particular needle, which goes in. You need to have a small amount of patience when you are going to do this particular job, actually. So that steps has to be very clearly. Okay. After this, you have to lock it. Lock, lock it. it. Yeah. So that this will be a needle will be part of your bronchoscope, so that it will act as a single segment. So now next, the sheath movement will be done by this particular a lower knob. Actually, what we are seeing. Is, Metal knob, which will be the one which will go to regulate our sheath. If your tip is not visualized with the tip of a sheath, definitely not to get it because otherwise the chance of your injury to your working channel will be the most common encountered complication. Then we have this particular regulator actually, which I think will guide you to know what is the length of your needle which gets out of this particular e bus scope. And this is a stillet thing, what we generally to use actually to try to get this get that negative pressure so that we can draw a lymph node sampling into the needle assembly. I'm okay that uh, with? The second time. Okay. Yeah, the audio visual to check uh, Dr. Arvind's mic is not loud enough. Yeah, now I think very clearly, yeah. Now I think uh, we're going to fix up the sheet actually. Then there will be a lot of strain on the distal part when you flex too much actually. The needle can get sometimes stuck so that you will not be in a position to negotiate the needle beyond the sheath. Yeah. Uh, make sure you have a good sync with your technician also to, uh, to get this thing to this so that it will not damage your channel, working channel. Is not a big of the biggest node actually. What we are trying to sample it is only a 10 millimeter node actually. Yeah. Only thing is stick to your basic stuff so you will not be wrong in this particular uh, thing. So to sample the vessel. Yeah, questions I can put it up. If you have doubts, you ask me. Put it up. Yeah. 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 You can the tip of a needle actually with some. If you want a more further length of your needle, actually, yeah. This is a wonderful thing what we generally enjoy as an intervention thing, actually, to see the needle through and through. You can see the needle, the tip of needle there, exactly. Can you see the movement? Yeah, this is a four, two and four movement, generally. Generally, if you see our uh, needle, generally we have three different parts in the needle. First is the one which just beyond the tip, and then suddenly we have an invisible form where there'll be a ghost sort of a stuff, actually. That can be because of your angulation of your lymph node, which cuts uh, horizontal to that actually, so that you are tend to miss your image on the ebus uh, one. You can see the distal thing, which is jig. I'm trying to jiggle this thing actually. Yeah. Okay, there's a fanning method. I think Dr. Sunil was showing the fanning method by flexing and extending. Flexing. The... See, the movement should be only flexion and extension. It should not be a wrist movement yes. when it comes to fanning or so that. You can go to different corners of the lymph nodes actually. So that your chance of picking up any pathology will be much better dealt with. So can you see that the needle of moving from one end to another end when the opportunity in the fanning method? So from there. I think maybe 15 to 20 excursions actually. That would be adequate, I think. Uh, and make sure that you see the tip always. Any sort of a fresh blood is the one thing which is a not a complication, which generally we anticipate for doing a EBA so that you will not be sampling in the vessel. Okay, now I think you are okay to come out actually, Arvind. Yeah, just assembly, just need to stop in negative section, then pull and block, then raise your safety margin by locking this particular needle, and then just by unlocking the bottom attachment, you can remove the needle and block. It's important because it's Yeah. And three passes for nodes is a usual one. So three passes for nodes. make sure just any bleeding. Yeah. So Wonderful. Sure there's no excessive bleeding. Usually, we don't anticipate much of this. Yeah. I'm going to next negotiate, going to a seven import just to give a thing. Actually, these are the level of carina from so the endobronchial image. What we're seeing this is a right bronchus and this is a left bronchus. Ideally, when you start doing a staging of the lymph node, 
even if you tell if you think that there is a uh, lymph node which is there present on the n1 node will be on the right side n2 will be a current and subcurrent node and n3 will be a contractor that on the left side i think what you see on the left main i'm trying to negotiate to a left uh, main bronchus i think uh, arvin i think you will be in a position to at least guide us actually what is that mickey mouse and which people always tend to typically in most of the conferences actually Mickey Mouse, you can see there's a lymph node in the middle, the lymph node may be vessel sizes. Yeah. So that will be the Mickey Mouse sizes. This one is the pulmonary artery, the proximal, I mean, I would say that left is a pulmonary artery and right is the iota, what we see. In between that, a chunk of a lymph node that is constituted a poor lymph node, which gives a classical depiction of a Mickey Mouse sign. So, Dr. Sipti, are you happy with the size? I think you're not allowed to hear anybody here, I mean, I'm 30 as well. Right. Yeah, that's all right. I think thumbs up. I think uh, Arvin, yes. we've done our primary job. That we are stuck into the lymph node. Now we need to go with some multiple samples so that how to improvise our chance of getting a diagnosis. Arvin, can you just try your mic? We are unable to hear you. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. Uh, which one do you prefer, actually, Arvin? You left or right? We'll go to the toss and between me and you. There's a way for you to negotiate to left main bronchus yeah. or right main bronchus. Yeah. Right. When you enter the left main bronchus, you have to keep your toes towards your. Superb. So this is what the same principles as a sincere student I'm following what instructions given by Arvind. Left main, make sure that we saw that Mickey Mouse and then go rotate 180 degree actually so that you can come on the lateral aspect of a yeah, when it comes to the one more tricky area on the left side is that your esophagus is really closely associated actually. Invariably we tend to sample most of the esophagus when you are not clear with the anatomical stuff. So if you go on the right side also, it will be much better off to get this. I think, Arvin, are you happy? It's a very a nice sample there. Mm. Yeah, right side also, I just, just, sorry, I just wanted to make sure that on the right side also, we get the same similar sort of an image. Once you've done the right side, then you can go into the product on the right side as well. So that you are... Yes, that's a wonderful thing. So as a beginner, these are the words of gold, actually, which you need to know. How to choose your right and left based on what comfort, based on what the endobronchial image, and at the same time, lymph node chunk, what we can see in this particular, in case a small uh, flesh. Sometimes the channels also get clogged, I think the lungs can get clogged. We go for a small spicy of uh, flesh actually to clear this particular fog. Which is yeah. Now better. Yeah. Are you happy? You know, this compared to the left main bronchus, much better, I think. Bigger, then I think you have a better chance to sample the lymph node very clearly yeah. and more confidently. Super. So I think we go with the right. Right, 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 right then after that, you can go for the Kyla and other lymph nodes. Okay, okay. Okay. Yeah. So Be mindful about the sheath also because sheath can end your flexion most of the time. So that if too much of a sheath, definitely your uh, vision gets compromised actually. Be mindful about that. Yeah. Can you measure the lymph node size actually, Jarrah? We'll take some small help of a balloon also sometimes if at all if you are finding it difficult to approximate with the wall. I think probably the downstairs they'll do the next and all this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. This is the station seven. Thirteen point four. I think this is a bigger one actually compared to the paratrachal actually. Hopefully you should get a good amount of visual thing on the monitor actually. I think is ready to yeah, I'm ready to puncture actually. And at the same time, we may ensure that there's no vessel around actually. Yeah, Doppler. Yeah, there is a problem actually, Arvind. There's a problem. So try to negotiate where you Yes, that's a wonderful thing actually. See, it's a track which you should be very careful actually. You need to be more cautious because when you go to a traverse of vessel actually, there's a chance of bleed also slightly goes up. Be mindful about them. Choose the area where there will be less of a vessel actually. Okay. Yes, Jaraj. Take over the Doppler. 
So when Dr. Negro, Dr. Suni negotiated the nipas, she noticed from the vessels, it moved away from the non-vesicular yes. area actually, less vascular area, I would say. So there's no major vessel transfer in there, yes. within the lymph node, I would say. Right. Thanks, Arvind. Yeah, you can see the nice needle getting into the Very meat nice. of the tissue. Yeah. I mean, this is what we wanted. Yes, exactly. Yeah. A very smooth, nicely functioned. Now we go for a multiple end to end cortex as much as possible, actually. You can see that the jiggling, the distal, whatever the endothelial stuff is there, which will be cleared by jiggling of this particular stillet. Then we go for a multiple excursions, actually. At the same time, we go for this capillary pull slowly so that whatever tissue which is there in the needle can be pulled out so that we get a streak of a lymph node which can solve our business today in terms of getting an answer to the you know, patient. Dr. Sunil are moving from one end to another end so that we sampling the entire lymph node. And be mindful that we were to near vicinity of a vessel. Now, if you can see this tip actually, we are not in the blood stream. So that, that gives the confidence to go for excursions much more confidently. Okay, you can see that the needle moving in and out from cortex to cortex as much as possible. Be mindful about the bleeding complications also. If there's any, that has to be informed immediately and into about the thing. Yes, Arvind, you okay? Yeah, now make sure the needle is in, then lock the section, pull up the needle sheet, and then try to remove end block. Yes. Arvind, is it okay for that? Yes, Another job. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. I think there is a small amount of oozing also. We will try to focus and then see how, how bad is the bleed. And then we take a call actually how to go about in action. I think this sort of a bleed is anticipated in any sort of a lymph node. We have too much of vascularity. What do you say? Oh, there is a jet. Can you get your balloon? I think what you are not supposed to do as a beginner, we are seeing this sort of a complication. There is a jet of bleed which is happening over there. Yes. Balloon. Inflate, inflate, inflate. Yeah, I think we sides we can just go focus on the sides actually. In the meantime, we'll try to control the bleeding actually, and then we'll switch on to the next. Yes, 
Is it? You can see the spot of a bleed over there. Are you nipping? Okay. So we're just trying to push the adrenaline in the eyes actually. Then I think we we'll stop. You can just focus on the site. Yeah, stop the stop it, stop the transmission there. And just Different, 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 during any procedure, even a simple broposcopy can have a massive stem of bleeding from the biopsy. I recently, like a few weeks ago, I had a recent endoconcha growth. When we take the biopsy, patients drink massive bleeding. But the idea is you should have all the gadgets. You should have your patient as well as your confidence to secure the bleeding. As a main operator, if let's say your confidence level six, there's, there's no way for you to how to save the save the patient. So, like, because we found Dr. Sunni handling very smoothly and calmly, that shows the level of experience and confidence. So, then we have all the gadgets to secure the So, some of the methods are balloon methods. We see the coast line, and finally, pressure. And we can say the endoconcept goes away. You can always see that argon plasma coagulation and sometimes you can use the cryo, which is how and freeze methods. There are a few other methods for this. Again, from the I think these are the one thing which you are, as, a, as a beginner, you're not supposed to get into this actually. Yes. I think probably we have a very strong team with a good anesthesia backup and with the good uh, technicians also being helping us actually in terms of fixing up this problem. You could saw that fountain, the jet which came out actually. Yes. That was a vessel which was uh, punctured in this particular area where immediately to arrest the bleed actually, we went in with a balloon, try to inflate, get a good approximation actually, and try to arrest the bleed on the local side. Yeah, I think uh, Arvind, I think we are done with the first thing actually, first case. Should we go for an endobronchial biopsy also for this particular patient who has a luminal compromise? We'll go on to find out the, what are the hyla stuff actually. Let's see hyla structures and then take a next decision whether to abort the procedure or not. Yeah. Yeah, so this is Yeah, just come. We'll change the scope immediately. We'll see examination of the right hilar nodes actually, like whether there's a prominence of a right hilar lymph node is there or not. We'll just see it and then we take a call whether to puncture this particular lymph node or not. Yeah. You can see a big pulmonary artery which is just traversing this particular lymph adjacent to the lymph node. We're coming back to the four hour lymph node, what we had initially. This was a chunk of a lymph node, what we attempted actually, and I had some significant bleed just now. 
good that there's no desaturation and then our anesthesia team was efficient to give a airway without any much of a change in plan. Okay. So this was our lymph node actually from where we sampled actually. You can see that there was actually an initial put a doctor. Yeah, this was a blood vessel which is private in the vessel. I think we also have Hari Kishan to with that actually. And, uh, welcome, welcome, Hari. Okay. Uh, this is a chunk of a hilar lymph node. What we see at least a uh, 11 R. There is no any blood vessel points actually. You can just estimate the size. Eleven R lymph node actually with a size of 12.8 millimeter. We'll try to sample this uh, lymph node and then end the whole procedure. Are you any tips, sorry? Hmm? Yeah. We'll try to go to eleven path lift mode. Yeah. I think there are no nearby vessels which you can see in this particular uh, image. Twenty-one, twenty-one gauge needle, right? You see the needle getting in? Yeah, I think we will ensure that we are not in the vessel. I think we will go with the. Yeah. First section, section, take over the section. I think we'll go for at least five to ten jabs actually. Hopefully that the, the cell is not filled with the blood actually, if at all then the vessel. But still we'll try to make a initial workup in terms of what is the reason and the how do yeah. There's a vessel which is gone through. Okay. Stop. I think we have taken uh, two passes from the paratracheal and one pass from the subcanal and also two from the, I think the plan is to take, if there is no bleed, uh, two more samples from the right uh, lower hilar 11 hour station. I think Vasa will get back to you with all the histopathologic stuff with the rose and all things shortly. Let's see, let's see the bleeding point also. Let's see, let's see. Yeah. 
Christian. Yeah. Oops. Yeah. Oh, old one. Yeah. Ah, old one, old one. The seven hour the one past the other one meeting today. Some sort of a malignancy was the antidepressant because this was a stable patient without any comorbid condition, came with only right head chest pain. So, this is a new mode in Olympus. Where uh, you can, uh, where it's a very good factor, not just for the, uh, I mean, not for the needle particularly, but when you're doing endobronchial biopsies or tumor debulking, mm -hmm. uh, this mode is using a, uh, a new light of wavelength uh, that will absorb more uh, light and then it will show where exactly that uh, point starts to bleed so that you have some control over where to apply, and like if you have a lesion like. So imagine right now you have like you, you have a lesion here and then you start taking an endobronchi biopsy, it starts to bleed. The problem with the pulmonary endoscopy is that once it starts pouring out, uh, for me to apply um, non-contact thermal energies are very difficult. So if there is a blood and then that energy goes on to the blood and then you cannot identify a local point. So that is where these kind of new modalities come that will pinpoint the area of bleeding and then you can use your APC coagulation or whatever modality you are using exactly there to control the bleed. So this was uh, a lot of research was done in the GI endoscopy you know, because the advantage with the GI endoscopy is that they have A2 plus when they are using the uh, endoscope they have water so whenever there is a bleed they can water but with the bronchoscopy we only have suction so we have to see how this new technology will evolve in pulmonary endoscopic case as well. But it's a very interesting feature. I think uh, um, maybe in the next one or two years, we'll have many centers performing uh, uh, with this new X1 processor. We are also planning to get one. Uh, and, uh, and there are some other modes also, like the old NBA continues to be there here. And also there is a new mode called uh, texture enhancement mode, that's CXI mode. Um, So it enhances the structure, texture, color, contrast. All the four parameters are enhanced. So okay. normally, what happens is when in a bronchoscopy, the crystal imaging, uh, uh, you see the when you are in, like imagine you are in a bronchus intermediate, and then uh, you you will be able to see the lower lobe bronchus, but you will not see it clearly. There will be like a black color image here. So the penetration, the clarity of the okay. segmental bronchi also is much more enhanced with this new technology. Okay. So de demarcation is proper, so lesion detection will be much easier compared to the white light. Check, check, check. Check, check. And also the another advantage is this is, this is uh, you can have a full screen image, you can uh, show that. Yeah. Yeah. So you can have a complete full screen photo imaging with this uh, uh, to have um, good um, thing when you're doing bronchoscopy. Yeah. Are you, should we go for endobronchial biopsies also with this uh, patient? No, sir. Most of the uh, walls look edematous and I don't find any irregularity or uh, anything there. So, we better uh, not to do endobronchial biopsies. What is your opinion? Yeah, I think probably that's the, I should stick with the same process actually. We have, I think, our pathologist giving, trying to give some fluid in terms of water samples and anything which is there, we can add it. Uh, in the initial pass, we had lymphoid cells. The second pass was predominantly bronchial contaminant cells. Mm -hmm. And the third pass also has some lymphoid cells. Right. So we have definitely entered the lymph nodes and there are some suspicious cells also in the suspicious. first pass. Fine. Yeah, I think Arvind would like to summarize the whole thing actually. What, what I think uh, Dr. Sunil has sent, uh, sampled the three lymph nodes. And then I think that's a sufficient material seen already confirmed by our pathologist. So I think that's sufficient for us to conclude this.
post procedure bol 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 to bol to bol that's about it i think yeah are would like to add some more new technology what we have actually to aid us in terms of the trouble shooting and bleeding in a case of endobronchial stuff yeah right yeah. anything else actually would like to say actually because in this patient we had a jet of bleed actually passing a subcranial lymph node then we used a balloon to tampon this sort of a bleeding point and we were able to achieve a good hemostasis maybe rarely you see such a bleed happening in but but it happens uh, sometimes you can never uh, Uh, no, there is no uh, ebus bronchoscopy sir who can say that i never had a bleed like this why because um, sometimes uh, you have small vessels that starts to pour up the first thing what you should be doing uh, when you have a bleed is first to stay calm okay second thing if you are using a balloon already on the ebus scope stay there and let's increase the volume of the balloon and try to do occlusion with the ebus balloon itself on the wall so most of the times you will be able to stop the bleed uh one other indication where you anticipate like once you did a pass and then you come out with the scope the time you go and see uh, into the bronchial tree again if you see blood at the vocal cords that means the hemorrhage volume is more so that is where you have to be very uh, uh means rapid in uh, getting your scope and suction in, into the bronchial tree because Uh, we recently had a clot, uh, clot in the trachea that almost like the stats gone up to zero after an ebus puncture by my one of my colleagues so quickness of a uh, suctioning and availability of your equipment everything plays a very important role okay because always once you do a puncture again it is important for you to go and examine the site of your puncture 99.9% with ebus bronchoscope the bleed never happens but 0.1% you have to be careful if, if you know what you you should do and always having a rigid bronchoscopy as a backup also is important if you are working in a setup where rigid bronchoscopy is available yeah because what happens is uh, clinically um, when when there is something in problem in the endoscopy they, then you start touching where is the equipment so that time will uh, take away the patient that's why so it should be very quick uh, procedure so what is it your experience with dr jeffrey like uh, on bleed during ebus bronchoscopy uh hello hi you uh, you can you can hear me yeah uh i i i was watching uh the 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 procedure uh well i i mean there are a few uh, points uh, i i think uh, i can make uh number one is that the uh, uh you, you you can visualize the sheath on the bronchoscopic picture this is a vis shot too so it's green color you can see it very very well uh there there are some uh, procedures who who sometimes rely on the ultrasound image of the sheath because maybe there's blood there's mucus or another the the scope view is is blocked uh if if you are just starting out uh you may not want to do that because there's a chance you can dam damage your scope and it's expensive but but uh, uh there there are there are different ways uh If if you see uh, different procedures, there are different ways uh, to 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 do this. Yeah. Uh, the other point is that uh, for for the first lymph node, it was quite small, so you do not have the the needle transversing the lymph node. Uh, sometimes the tracheal walls and the tissues are elastic, so when you uh, push a needle, right, it, the needle isn't going through the lymph node. It's it's just shifting. It's just moving and and it bounces. Uh, that happens when you have a uh, small small lymph node. Uh, but but uh, Doctor Sunil is extremely skillful. He still manages to get adequate uh, lymphocyte tissue. Uh, on on the subcranial lymph node, it's much larger, so uh, you could see the tip of the needle transversing the the the, the lymph node, and that's what you should try to 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 achieve. Uh, the third point I have is about the balloon. Um, you 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 probably assist your 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 colleagues a lot, uh, or if you are training, you you'll be involved in assisting. Um, I think the balloon uh, titrating it is a skill. Uh, typically, what I do is uh, I look at the screen and then I inflate, and I uh, then try to adjust the size of the balloon uh, according to the to the to the screen uh, image. So so uh, if if uh, it's over inflated, I will try to deflate it, and uh, of course I take instructions or cue from the the, the procedure. So so. Have you encountered any bleed during your ebus? I must say, uh, uh, to me, uh, ebus is a very safe procedure. 
uh, I've encountered leads, uh, but it's very, very rare. Uh, most of the time, right, I just install uh, cold saline, adrenaline, or chanexamine, and it will stop the bleed. I've never had to resort to using a, a, a balloon. Yeah. So I must say that uh, uh, today I've uh, seen and watched and learned something from Dr. Sumi, who has very, very calmly uh, uh, arrested the bleed and stopped the bleed. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Frank. I think we'll try to ensure that I think once again, before we go to about the procedure, we took a ball also from the right upper lobe and middle lobe also to look out for any sort of other etiology. At the same time, we are taking the site where there was a jet of a bleed which was spurting from the right main bronchus actually from the middle side of a wall. Okay, and we are ensured that there's no more bleed point and then we can just stop this particular procedure at this point. Thank you. Thank you, Ari, for that uh, good insight in terms of a bleeding point. Thanks, Arvin, for making my life easy, actually, in terms of tackling this particular bleeding. What's that? Is it okay? We are going to stop this particular trans transmission. We'll break for at least uh, 15 to 20 minutes. Then we'll come up with a new case, actually. Or what's that? Guru. Ah, no. Uh, readily. We have one more case also, so don't worry, you get a chance. We get a chance. We get
அங்க யாரும் யூடியூப் யூஸ் பண்ணா சார் யூடியூப் அங்க யாரும் யூஸ் பண்ணல அவன் என்ன சொல்றான் எந்தல எதுமே இல்ல என்னோ சவுண்ட் வரதாது இல்லடா கிரங்க இப்ப வர ஸ்டாப் 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 கேக்கா எவனா வேணா ஹலோ ஹலோ டேய் வந்துருக்கு பா வந்துருக்கு ஹலோ சரம் வரதா நீங்க யூடியூப் பத்தி பேசுறதா இப்ப வந்துருக்கு எல்லா <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
And that, uh, just play the Dinesh, Dinesh, just play that uh, radiology video.
Deep on. Okay. Just one. Press one more. Deep press. Deep press. Just keep it on. No. Your mic is here. Speaking like this and speaking, the audio is not working because of the mic. Am I audio or not audio? No, it is not audible. The call is not audible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Are you just keep this as a fixed image there on the screen, and then on the side? Oh, yeah. Very soon we'll be going back to the OT uh, for the second case. So the second case, I'll just basically brief you before Dr. Sunil starts. So the second case is primarily a radial EBS case. So. What you saw initially was a linear EBUS case. So I hope there's no doubts with regards to the first case. If there are any doubts, we can sort that out before we move on to the second case. First, uh, go on to the PowerPoint. PowerPoint, please. Sorry? He's looking to have a phone. So uh, I'll just mute you. Okay. Once you're ready, you just let me know. Okay. And then I'll I'll on it. I, so what is the case, sir? What is the radial delay? So, okay. Anyway, there's no question of anonymity here, unfortunately, because we have to show you the CT scan. So, so this is a patient who is about 62 years male patient who basically presented with uh, fever, cough with expectoration, significant loss of appetite, and significant loss of weight. Maybe you all start on the chest x-ray, we had a very well-defined 
lesion in the right lower zone. I'll show you the X-ray in the subsequent slide. And repeat chest X-rays, despite you know considering to be a pneumonia, showed worsening. The past history of small bowel obstruction and uh, status for laparotomy in view of duodenal ulcer. Query resections. Patient is not really sure. About 40 years back. General physical examination. Patient is conscious oriented, is saturating about 95% at room air. BP is okay. The respiratory is about 26 cycles per minute and pulse rate around 90 beats per minute. Dinesh, move on to the CT scan, please. So play the media stainer window first, please. No, the, the third one, Dinesh. Third one. After that, after that. Yes. So as we go through the media stainer windows, what we are li literally searching for is lymph nodes. You see there's hardly any significant lymph nodes, except yeah, for station seven, which is a very small lymph node. So Dinesh, can you play this again? And when the lesion in the right lower zone comes, just pause a bit. Go up, go up. So yeah, pause below, go, go down Dinesh. Yeah, so you see this lesion here. So it's in the peripheral one third, like Dr. Arvind was describing yesterday. And definitely you see this. Homogeneous lesion. The center, you see that there's a contrast of the gray scale. So this is more or less like necrosis. So it's a very necrotic lesion in the right lower zone. So play the parenchymal window. That is the Third image from, from top, yes. Video, please. I'll stand on the back. I'll hang back. So, again, okay. yeah. So, basically, in an ideal situation, we'd have to CT map it. Right, like what Dr. Shizang was, and he's already done it. I will let him do the talking after he finishes his case about how he mapped this so that he will roughly show you what are the diagrams. If possible, we'll scan his diagrams and put it up so that we know which airway he's using. Anyway, Shizang is there up there. So the operators for this case will be Dr. Hari, Dr. Sunil, and Dr. Shizang. Okay, so three of them will be joining us shortly. They are possibly inducing the patient now. So then I'll shift to the OT screen. Maybe they should show you. Ask them if they're ready. Hi, what's up? Can you hear me? What's up? Uh, we are ready here with the case. Uh, can you hear us? What's up? Can you hear us? Can you, can you hear us? What's up? Can you hear us? Yeah, Hari, I can hear you now. Yes. Yeah, yeah. we are just looking at the, the radiology. Drop into looks the looks like a very peripheral lesion with some yeah. necrotic component in the uh, middle, right? Yeah. Yes, true. Uh, so it looks like a very necrotic lesion. That's what I was telling. Possibly infective, more mm -hmm. chances rather than malignancy. So let's see. So like how we prepare for such cases is like uh, even you can go for a trans thoracic approach. But since this is a um, workshop, we just wanted to show you the principles of radial yep, or yep, peripheral yep. pulmonary lesions. So there are many ways to target such lesions. Like you can, um, like when you are talking on radial ebus, uh, most of our centers in our country do a hit and run approach where you discuss the radiology and then try to go in that uh, lobar segment and then See if you get an image and then get a biopsy. Otherwise, there is something called a manual tracing technique 
where uh, you map accordingly and then going to the exact location. Most of the times you are successful with that uh, when you have a CT bronchus sign. And uh, third thing is like when you have some navigation equipment in your OT, you can also use that just to save some time uh, where you uh, preload the CT and then it shows us like which subsegment the lesions are. But the problem with those navigations is beyond the fourth and fifth generation bronchi. Um, again, the matching doesn't happen properly because the, there is collapsibility in the peripheral airway. So in this first, what we will do is we'll just go in with the bronchoscope, a thin scope. Ideally, it should be an MP190 scope with a 3mm di outer diameter. I hope uh, Z agrees with me. Yep, yep. Uh, or if you have like an uh, P190 with a 4.2, that also should help. So first go in and check the segment, see if you have any endobronchial, sometimes surprisingly, on the CT, you may not find any endobronchial pathology, but uh, in the bronchoscope, you can find some endobronchial changes that will uh, indirectly show us like, okay, the mucosa is also involved and you can take endobronchial biopsies. And if there is no endobronchial pathology, so first what uh, Dr. Sunil is doing is trying uh, and seeing and reading the bronchial mucosa, how it is. Like what I can see is some ectatic bronchi. Uh, Yes. And then Can you switch on the endoscopic vision, please? Overlook. Switch on the endoscopic vision, please. The target uh, lesion, I think, is in uh, the RB6. RB6, right? Yeah. And also yeah. some um, in the RB10, maybe some overlap. Unable to see. Endoscopic vision. So what we do is we just uh, go into the RB6 and do a uh, blind um, hit and run approach. Dr. Sunil will take the EBUS uh, radial probe. And then first we have two segments there. So he'll try to put the probe in one segment and then the later the other segment. First do a hit and run approach. If you're uh, easily, if you can get the image of your, on the radial ebus, you can take biopsies. Otherwise, Dr. Z will explain you how to do the uh, tracing based on his mapping that he did already before the procedure starts. Okay. So I think we'll just go through the anatomy briefly. So this lesion is mapped to RB. Shazang, Shazang sorry. I'll show you later how I do it. So we have the main carina. When we make a clockwise turn into the right man, we can see the right upper lobe. Shazang. The intermediate. Excuse me. The right middle lobe. The basal uh, lower lobe. And this is the B6. So usually I'll go on the reverse approach. I'll put B6 on the uh, superior aspect. So now you can see this side is medial. This side is lateral. This yep. is superior and this is inferior. So we go in, we can expect to see two lumens which is this is medial and this is lateral. So our target is that the lateral aspect. So when I go in, I'll expect to see another two uh, lateral and medial. And then we go into the medial one. Unfortunately, we cannot go in further. So we just put in the radio probe. Maybe in the guide shift. In the guide shift. So what he's done is he's gone into B6. Okay. So that's the right superior segment of the lower lobe. And then subsequently he's gone into a subsegment. <laughs> so B6 usually we divide it as A, B, C. So you can see this uh, target segment. Distally, there's another two bifurcation. So our target is the lower one. So hopefully I'm right. So now we are putting the radio prop in the guide shift. Okay. Come out of it. All right. So this is a new guide shift kit, which is more durable and flexible. So usually we put the radio prop out around 1 cm. Maybe pull back a little bit. Pull back. Okay. Uh, out, 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 out. Out a little bit. Yep. So insert into the working channel. I need to get the arm a little close. Sorry. Uh, you can already see some mucus there. Yep. Uh, so the challenges I think in this case would be since we are suspecting okay, infection. 
you you, um, like you, you have a very thick mucus again the radial epos images also will have like um, an appearance that of uh, uh, a solid lesion sometimes so yeah maybe change to radial I hope so as expected we are now seeing the uh, solid lesion on the radio so i'll pull back my prop so this is almost a normal appearance of the lung so when I push in further, you can see the solid component appear. So we are at the center of the tumor. So this is the lesion. Right? So if I push further, I will miss the lesion. So I go pull back, you know, and you can see some hypoechoic lesion there, which is consistent with the necrosis. necrosis. Yeah. So, yep, then after that, we will, we will lock the guide shift and then we will do biopsy. Oh, you just pull it up. You okay. hold it. You okay. can put this clip here. Yeah, this is a new locking. Or you just, if you don't, you're not comfortable, just remove that part. Yeah. Hold the, 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 the. Yes, pull up. Okay. okay. Press it. And then now we activate the fluoroscopy to confirm. Yep. Do, do you uh, think a fluoroscopy in this uh, is needed? I think no need because yeah, it's, yeah, it's been quite big. Yeah. Because we are, we are, we are very uh, sure that we are in the lesion with the yes. ultrasound image on the radial probe. Yeah. So what we usually do is we confirm with fluoroscopy again to make sure that we are well inside the lesion. So have they measured the the four step length? Uh, uh, maybe now, uh, since we didn't measure the process line, then maybe we have to use the fluoroscopy to guide the. So, for uh, beginners, uh, that uh, thing before them standing is the C arm. That's how we shoot the fluoroscopy, it's like shooting x ray. And then we have a fluoroscopic image in the OT uh, where we'll see okay. whether the probe is sitting right in the lesion or not. Yeah. Okay. So, maybe you want to take over? Okay. <laughs> Maybe we just do it again. Just put the radio prop in. Yeah. Then I'll handle that radial prop and keep it. Sorry. I think uh, doing a radial levers is an art actually. <laughs> Probably we have an expert in front of us actually who is actually playing the airway just like as if he's driving a Ferrari actually. <laughs> I think that's a well worth it what we need to see at least when we need to start using our radial levers actually. Somebody has done some sort of a good amount of uh, radial levers. This is one sort of a thing where we have this sort of a proper planning is yeah. a need for the thing to lead to operate in a comprehensive way. So I think we have spent a good amount of time in terms of mapping it. I think well was retreating whatever the visual memory what he has actually. Mm. And then I try to deliver it on that. So it makes life easy. Rather than Thank going you. there as a black what point actually, hunting for what could be the way, way multiple options. It is one more technique actually where it can be very cumbersome sometimes Will and very frustrating also sometimes mark, uh, if you are not in a position to candidate the right bronze. Yeah. Or you give me the portrait. So if you want to name it, so this will be the six. Will accurately mark it. Six A that. because it's lateral, medial B. So 6A, and then again, medial lateral. So 6, not to show how to call it, maybe a C or something. <laughs> yeah, but it doesn't matter because we just need to, need to know the airway. That will see anyways on the floor. So he will teach you the naming of it. It's A, B, C. So he's going to 6A. And then 6A is going into the... Uh, not the medial, the lateral aspect. I think probably no need the lock, Harry. You need the lock. Thank you. Uh, it's my pleasure to have Dr. Harry assisting me. So when we insert, insert the radial probe, we have to be very careful. We usually do not hold a big segment. If we curl and break, 
it will be difficult. So usually you hold a very short seg segment and push. Uh, no, no, scope view. So we'll go through knobology and all that in the That's workstation, that how to operate the radial e bus. Very okay. similar. So, pro. Right, right middle. Right. Right. You have to lift the height of the patient. Eh? Okay. okay. So as I move the probe uh, forward, we are I'm seeing the EBAS image as well as on the fluoroscopy. Sorry, to make sure I'm in the correct place. So I think this is a very good place to biopsy. Yeah, then we remove the probe. Yep. Yeah, I just want to say, I think there was some hypoechoic lesion inside that lesion. Is it a necrosis or a blood vessel? Yeah. In the interest of time, actually, we just have some small lesion in terms of but how to different between a blood vessel and a necrotic tissue in this. I think we will see the pulsatility. If the thing is pulsatile, then it's very likely a vessel. Yeah. Right. And most of the times on the red liver, you see vessel as a round structure. Correct. So round structure, anechoic, pulsatile. Okay, yeah, floral. Because radial levers, unfortunately, no Doppler. Uh, activate floral. Activate continuous leaf screening. Continuous. Activation. Continuous. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Can you focus on the screen where? Can you zoom a bit? Now, I think I can see the photos totally open up there. Yeah, I think so the camera should look at the. Anything is endoscopically you fixed your sheet of the radial ebus. There's a stopper there. So what he's so doing, the trying to do now, Hari is putting yeah. a forceps in through the sheet, and they biopsy based on the fluoroscopy, very not based close, on any close. other imaging. The left okay. image very close. Left image very close. So the opening of the. It's very difficult because you're close, approximated to the wall. Yeah. So now you can see the fluoroscopy is focusing there. Okay. You can see the open forceps there. Okay. And then I close it. Okay. Uh, activate fluoro. You can just hold the probe there. No, sorry. Yeah. I got some resistance. Yep. Yeah. So, so you, you can see the uh, the guide shift still stay in place. And this guide shift will serve as a tamponade effect. So any bleeding, it will wedge there. So we take we go in for the second biopsy. So the lesion floral on continue. Floral continue. So I the contrast of the fluoroscopy is not very good here. Ideally, when you look at the fluoroscopy, you will be okay. The forceps is coming out. I pull back my it will not always be full black. Again, we'll discuss okay. Good, nice. By biopsy ground glass. Gate. Okay. So fluoroscopy is just a guide on where the lesion, but the radial ebus is the actual point. So once the Can radial the identifies the lesion, we fix the Any sheet. Tissue? Very good, good, good tissue. 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 Sorry, keep dropping. Roughly four, four, four to five. Sometimes you just uh, do a front and back movement. Yep. So, uh, Dr. Z, like how many biopsies like you try to take in these patients? Um, so usually yes. I'll do five rounds. Mm -hmm. Then I put in my radio probe to check again, make sure I don't dislodge. Then another five. And finish. Yeah, because we, we have a doubt of uh, uh, infection here. I think uh, taking more samples for uh, culture mm. and also for expert, I think that. Uh, yeah. Uh, no, mm -hmm. not so for, those like, of you who are not there the about intent, sample processing, I think, uh, I like we the, discussed uh, earlier, if you're thinking, sure. suppose in this case, good. because of necrosis and other things, tuberculosis, you put these samples in a saline sample, a saline bottle, rather than a formal. 
and then you have extra samples processed for the histopathology informally. Sorry. Some resistance inside. Can you just learn go that again? There is a king here. Oh, it's king. Oh, okay. That's true. All right. It's okay. It's okay. What I will do is. So in bigger centers uh, where they see a lot of malignancies, they can sometimes do something called imprint cytology. Yeah. They take this tissue of the tissue from the radial ebus, put it onto the slide, just press on the slide, and then you do your quick staining, telling, like telling. Dr. Angela was telling yesterday, and see under the microscope to see if the sample is adequate, and maybe sometimes even make a diagnosis. So very quick way of making diagnosis like a rose technique. Yeah, once again, I think I want all the viewers to follow. Once again, the, the same procedure will be repaired once again, actually. See the way the house, the uh, radial labors will be candidate, radial uh, probe actually will be candidate through the bronchoscope to the B segment. B6, what we are going to candidate. Yeah, Yeah. No, no? Yeah. I think the guy should be a little yeah. more peripheral. Do this, sir. Yeah. Okay. So your forceps is out beyond the sheath. Open. So once you open and pull back the sheath, will actually lock your forceps. You understand? You feel that once you of resistance to the uh, sheet, when you get the you biopsy, open, you pull. So your the hand should feel not the actual sensation. So that means the operator your feet, uh, also will get the so feeling. Sometimes even uh, if you don't see the lesion, just by the feel, and then we'll we do some brush that the biopsy here. Thing is sitting itself. So the actual radial EBA process, I think number one is the navigation. Number two is the intra procedure or this. Floral? or this catheter bath maneuver. So I'll pull back my uh, plural, pull back my guide shift a bit. Okay, nice. So Dr. Harry is doing a jabbing motion to brush. And then we do some slides on this. Yep. So a couple of instruments which we can use apart from the forceps. You can use a brush or you can even use a needle. And the needle is usually used when there's an adjacent lesion. I think Dr. Shizang was discussing about an adjacent lesion in one of his slides, the cases which he showed. So if the lesion is not well within, like if this is the radial ebus image, and you don't see it at the center, it is somewhere sitting eccentrically. Then if there is no leading bronchus to it, you'll stick Zorro. a needle into the lesion, get a, a slide from that and uh, use it as a, like just like we do FNAC cytology, right? For the EBUS, linear EBUS, you will do that with the radial EBUS. Just for this moment, I think Hari is doing wonderful work actually in terms of digging a breast actually, so that whatever the exploited technical uh, cells are there, it will be grabbed inside the breast actually, so that we can prepare a psychological yeah. sample actually. We are, sample where we can have our interpretation, in maybe within an hour or so actually. That will help us to know what sort of a lesion what we are dealing with. So, how many biopsies we did? Four, four, four biopsies. I think, biopsies. We, I, I think we should do, yeah. do a bit more. Yeah, a bit more. Biopsies. Or sometimes to, uh, when you are bang in the lesion with such a big uh, image, what we do just do is like we take out the guide sheet, go with the bigger forceps. And then, yeah. and then get bigger chunk of it too. Yeah. So you give the normal uh, green forceps. So the pieces which come through the radial EBUS forceps are very, very small, tiny. Yeah. Maybe uh, we just put in the radial EBUS again. There are two ways to do this. Either just you, yeah. like Hari said, pull out the sheath, go in with the bigger forceps, fluoroscope. The now you know that your pathway to so the yeah. so Just keep your scope there. Go in with uh, the bigger forceps. You want to get to the forceps? Or the yep. second Maybe possibility. we just confirm the radial EBAS again. Is to use a cryoprobe, okay. and then like what you used to okay. So the one, do it. one cryoprobe yep. goes through okay. the radial sheath. So put it through that, freeze, and uh, avulse the tissue and come out.
has got is uh, double one double zero. That, that's how much? Yeah, this is the three, uh, three, three millimeter channel. Nine with uh, three mm. Yeah. Two point two. Okay. All right, I'll pass it to Dr. Hari. Yeah, it's a general anesthesia because we don't want movement, too much movement of the patient. Because we are biopsying a lesion. The fluoroscopy which can vary with a lot of breathing. So the anesthetist will actually stop bagging for some time when you are actually biopsying. So we generally say anesthetists don't bag during the biopsy. Otherwise, the image will shift too much. Jelly? Not like that, no? I, I have the mic. Yeah. Suction? No, hurry, hurry. You do the bronze, I'll do the red. Uh, the big scope. Now we use the double one double zero. Uh, it has got a four point nine OD with, with a two point two mm channel. And then Dr. Sunil uh, is trying to show you uh, the basic segment on the right side. And then this is where I think the scope will land up. And then from there, we follow the path that we so already know. A, right? so, he's in B6. so now he yeah. has to calculate this. You saw with the smaller scope, right he and radial this. but now with the bigger scope, they will be unable to get through. So what you do is you shift medially because your uh, tissue is panel that allows your probes or whatever is it big enough? instruments to come out is at 3 o'clock. So push it this way, push it through that, and then... Uh, yeah. Can you let the this one yeah. identify it on radar, uh, the fluoroscopy and biopsy? Yeah. Not going. I think it's not going. Remove the cap. Remove the cap. You need a two point eight channel, I think. Ah, this one, right? Yeah. Sorry. Or we do one thing. We just put the radio probe. Yep. So now Dr. Sunil is uh, demonstrating another technique without guide shift. So we will just use the radio probe to localize the lesion. And then we mark it on fluoroscopy. Don't bend it. So as you can see, this is a bigger scope, so we can't really go deeper. And inside, we need to navigate two bifurcation. So it might be a bit of difficulty. So you can see the radial probe actually spinning there. Yeah? So you know when the radial probe is on and when it's off. Actually, when you put the freeze button on the top, it's available, it starts spinning. Okay. I think there's a small change in the direction. Uh, the Slight change, yeah. But I think it's okay. I mean the. It went into a different subsegment. In yeah, time. yeah. The radio Iba still very nice image. Yep, good. Okay. You, back, uh, you hold the uh, okay. We we'll take the normal biopsy process. So now we need to mark the position of the radio probe on fluoroscopy. Then after that, we will know how how far we need to advance our forcep. So now we are using a two millimeter uh, swing jaw Olympus forcep. It uh, can get very big tissue. Floral? There are two ways to do it. You can either even stick a small micropore onto the fluoroscopic uh, image yep. or the screen so that you mark the spot of the place where you're biopsying with the bigger forceps yep. and roughly go to that area and biopsy. No piece. Maybe you have a small black there that's showing an image out there. So you guys understanding what's happening here? Okay. Yep. Pull. 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 
No, I already closed it. Yeah. Last one. Last one. Close. Yep. The fluoro has two other functions. One, you know that there is a, any active ooze or bleeding. Second thing is you have created any pneumothorax. Right, because you are biopsying the periphery of the lung. Always watch for that. So sometimes, if you have uh, pathologist with you, you can put in a needle, and then you do TBNA, and then you do a rose. Okay, very good. Nice. Now this, this one more. Yeah. I, th I think that's quite a, uh, a good number of samples we took. So now, uh, sir, we show the bronchoscope image. Can we show the wrong image? So uh, I would like to ask, uh, see, like, what yep. would be the order of uh, uh, BAL uh, brush and then biopsy in these kind of cases? What 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 would you prefer to do? Yeah, I think, I think it's always a dilemma. It's a dilemma if you do BAL first then the airway will be flooded with water. When you do your, your examination, it will affect the quality a bit. So generally, I will, I will do the radiant EVAS first. Then if the guide shift has a lot of tissue, I'll just flush the guide shift uh, for, for microbiological analysis. Yeah. My turn? My, my, my turn. But of course, in this case, it's not a lot of bleeding. I think we can just do a, a lavage. So, um, as, as rightly uh, said by Dr. C, like uh, when you're planning to do a radial lipus, not to do um, a BAL or a bronchial wash in those segments before you attempt a biopsy procedure because sometimes that can cause image distortion. Yep. Uh, and also uh, try to keep your BAL as the last uh, procedure when you're planning a brush or a biopsy uh, because sometimes when you do a brush, uh, if there is some malignant uh, tissue that is a little deep, the brush will scrape away the peripheral uh, mm. things and then the ball gets good amount of uh, malignant yeah. uh, cells in that uh, sample. So that is one thing. And then once you finish the procedure, now Dr. Sunil is trying to go and see if there is any bleed from the segment where we did. Usually we don't use uh, balloon in such cases, but when you try to do I think this case, since we are suspecting infection, we don't want to do a 1.1 mm cryoprobe biopsies here because there is also necrosis, uh, uh, what we could see in the ultrasound image. So um, good samples, we got around six biopsies. We try to place three for them, uh, three of them in micro and then three for histopathology. And also we have made some slides from the brush, what we did. And yep. then that from their inspection of the bronchus also shows no further bleeding. Dr. Sunil is completing his BAL procedure and then we will end the procedure here. So they're just doing a ball finishing off. Any other procedure. questions from the audience, uh, Vatsa? Do you have any anything to add? Any questions you want to ask? Yeah, tell me, Dr. Lakshmi. Can you connect them directly there? Can you connect them directly there? Yeah. Dr. Lakshmi Narasimhan from uh, Mysore has a question. Yeah, just a very small question, brief doubt. So in this, you took the biopsy first, the brush later, and then finally the ball. So any specific reason for the sequence or it can be done anyway? First ball, then brush, then biopsy. Because what we have observed is sometimes after the biopsy, it starts uh, bleeding. Yeah. Then it's difficult to take a ball and others. I'll so, put this question across to uh, Hari. So Hari, I hope you heard the question. Yes, so, uh, Dr. So, 
see always uh, biopsy i think should be done uh, first before doing brush also why because when you are doing radial lipas if you do a brush and there is a bleed there that again will cause an image image distortion on the radial lipas after you go for a biopsy again this so i think a, a biopsy should always be done first lung. in such cases the lung nodule uh, that's my yeah. opinion uh i think lung ca or infection yeah ఉట్పుల్సెస్టేషన్ So she is possibly telling it's a granuloma on the tissue. So now there is a correlation. Uh, we see on the radiology there is necrosis. Also you see pus on the samples what we took. On the radial ebus also you have some areas of hypoechoic areas uh, that also are not looking like blood vessels. So we have a very good correlation in this case where all the uh, features are showing signs of uh, infection more than malignant. Yeah, I agree. And some of the location at B6 Yeah. Yeah, BCC is a very unusual location for uh, malignancy. Yeah. Good case. Yeah, just uh, okay. from uh, here actually Mata, I think probably Sezang will be dropping down actually to explain the mapping sure. how he is able to do this complicated map to a simple <laughs> stuff actually. I think he'll be there in two weeks down actually Mata. Sure, sure. Thank so you. Sezang will come down and he'll teach us how he did just like Thank this. You. How he mapped the place <laughs> and how he approached the B6A and the medial part of it. any other questions you have for him will uh, any other questions you have with regards to the procedure as of now ah think yield is better biopsy of course is uh, the yield is better so the brush usually we don't find the yield and the brush is now more or less used for microbiological examination rather than cytopathological examination so that depends on the your leading airway into the lesion so if you have an airway that goes directly into the lesion and you are having an end on image that's what we say on the radial ebus very clearly you will see the circle in the radial ebus sonography image right in the center of the lesion then you do a biopsy because most likely you will get an answer so biopsy or cryoprobe whatever in that situation will help whereas when you see an eccentrically placed lesion that is the circle in the image is right in the center but you see that hypoechoic lesion or the margins of the lesion very eccentrically placed that means you are in, you are in a adjacent bronchus now how to pull the probe out sometimes because like yesterday shazang was telling you through his uh, you know presentation sometimes because of the way the probe is designed when you push the probe it will go into the airway of least resistance so it has a particular angle which it takes there are certain devices called guiding devices which will help us push the probe back into the lesion now suppose you are unable there is no airway leading into the lesion at all and the nearest possible space you reach is adjacent to the lesion then you stick a needle into the lesion very close but how do you guide it you cannot guide it through radial ebus you have to guide it only through a fluoroscopy so you put the guide sheet very close to the lesion on fluoroscopy and then push the needle into the lesion yeah yeah you basically what you're trying to do is puncture the airway ball and get into the lesion yes so the problem with the ultrasound again is the you see for example your radial mini probe has to get through isn't it so that will be the only challenge with the ultra thin bronchoscope though sometimes you will be able to uh, you know cannulate till the periphery for getting you know certain types of specimens like ball or other types of specimens with fluoroscopy alone so we'll have the uh, 
operators come in now you can have any questions you want to ask the operators but uh, we'll move on to the third case after this there's one more case and uh, i'll tell you about the case i'll brief just give us some time this patient will get extubated shift to recovery then the new patient will come in get induced and then we can go back live again okay
I think you have a mic there. Uh, you can talk, you can speak from there. Hello. Um, Okay, um, this, let me do this. Just show how, how we do the navigation for the caches now. So I mean, this uh, Radiant Dicom uh, software. So I think everyone is familiar with this Excel card. So this is the, this is the, the deletion. And uh, I'll just bring you through briefly. So this is the, I think everyone will know this is the right man bronchus and the right upper lobe. And then as we go down, this the uh, uh, bronchus intermediates. And then it goes to middle lobe and lower lobe. And then it will come to B6. And then after that, you see there's a lot of branching here. There's one here, one here, and one going down. But if you scroll up and down, you can see this B6 branch very haphazardly. And it's very difficult to plan on Excel. So usually for this one, I will go to coronal. So you put an MPR. I'll find the B6. Okay, so you just drag the things here. It will go to B6. And then just to let you know, all these things are free. You can download on online free. So this is B6. So I'll just start drawing. Uh, let me see where should I. I'll just draw briefly. So this is lower lobe. So you can see this, uh, this image, okay? This will correspond to superior because this is superior. Ah, oh, crap. So this is inferior. Okay, this is medial. And this is, ah. Oh. So I just connect the mouse, it's a bit easier. Yeah, it's much easier. So we just focus on this B6. So a circle. So this will be correspond to this CT superior. This is medial. So this is medial. And this is lateral. Okay, this is superior. And that's inferior. All right. So B6, you know, you will go in like this. This is six. And this is the basal bronchus. Basal bronchus. So we just followed, we track this B6. So it's split to two. So just now, if you remember when we do scope, this is how we saw the B6, two, one medial and one lateral. So then when I follow this uh, lateral segment, it's quite long. 
and then it's split to two again, two, medial and lateral. So medial and lateral. So we are following this segment and then we follow through. And then it's split to up and down. So up and down. And then after that, it become uh, filled with mu mucus or things like that. And then you eventually go into the lesion. So you can expect, so this is the target. So you can see this probe placement will be here, a bit eccentric, which is just like if you remember the radial EBAS image, we have some, you know, it's not within the center. It's still eccentric, but it's within the lesion. So this is the map that I follow just now, you know, to, to go into the lesion. Yeah. Yep. So any, any questions, questions for him you have with regards to the tracing, airway tracing? So you can just see again, B6 split, split two, this one split up, down, up, down, and then the lower one will go in. So just draw exactly like this and follow and you will you basically, basically go in. Right, thank you. Yep, so all this takes a lot of practice. So whatever he's telling is a lot of practice, isn't it? So the, they have various nomenclatures for the airway. So you have to repeatedly do it until you get to know what you mean by even B6, B4, B5. That's the basic things you need to know. After that, how each segment gets classified into sub-segments from medial to lateral, what Dr. Shazang already told us yesterday in his presentation. And then each sub-segment, how you can relate, right? So this is, uh, you want to discuss this? No, I think you've already done this. Right, right. So usually I'll draw it, I'll put it on the scope system and then we just, I'll just, I'll just follow my route and yeah. Okay, thank you. Sometimes I think don't get intimidated with the nomenclature actually. I think like we have been practicing the nomenclature because uh, we, we get used to the airways such a way. They said one is Japanese way, how they put RB1, A, alpha, 2, and everything. Another one, if you notice the European and Western way, they say right upper lobe, superior bronchus, and all the things. So the idea is as long as you map it, like how we show here, and correlate with your findings during the bronchoscope. So I think get used to the airway first rather than you know getting you know that nomenclature. But nomenclature is important when you want to plan for, you know, exactly like you know, when you want to do advanced procedures, you know, in a difficult distal most. Everything that's supposed to be the way for us to go. So normal creatures comes as you practice because you have to know that RB1, then A, A alpha 2 and everything, then XY and everything comes into the picture. So try to draw, get used to familiarize, then you can name it, label it as you, as you go actually. Thank you. So <clears throat> technically, uh, we usually land up in SPN or PPN. We have a PET scan done. So do we really need to uh, repeat an HRCT so that we have a better quality image? Or do you, do you go ahead and map it with the PET? PET scan, I think we can't really with PET scan. We need at least 1 mm of the worst is 1.5 mm for me. So I, I think when I get my PET scan, usually it's 1.25, uh, it's non-contrast. The, the image quality is not so good, but I will still try my best to map. I, I'll, I'll try not to repeat uh, unnecessarily. Yeah, so usually I'll, I'll just, just go ahead. Yeah. What about the virtual? Uh, virtual bronc. Virtual I'm not, I'm not talking about your own. I'm kind of, you know, buying that Yeah. Yeah. Of course. I think. I think. Can you? Yeah. I mean. Yeah. So I usually because I'm using Mac, so I'm using Horus or Osirix. They have a free uh, respiratory endoscopy recon, which you can you can to a certain extent uh, construct the virtual bronchoscopy uh, image or video there. But to be honest, I find it not so useful <laughs> because they can't give you a road map. You still need to map it out yourself. So I think to me, I mean, to myself, this is the, the, the easiest method for us to do. But yeah, I mean, if you have access to any virtual brown, you know, I think it, it will be helpful as well. Change the, change the mapping a little more, make it a little more 
Yeah, yeah. Yeah. What one thing with radiologists is that I find it because some some of my colleagues they will ask radiologists to see is there any airway, and radiologists are not used to seeing all these small small airways. They will tell you there's no airway, and then if we just take it as such, then we will miss a lot of opportunity. Yeah. So I think it's still good. We we our as a bronchoscopist we need to look at the CT ourselves. Yeah. Not only for radial EBUS, even for linear EBUS, if you notice, radiologists are used to label as a paratracheal or subcranial. We used to label as a 4L, 4R, 7, 10, R. So there's a differences in the way we approach compared to radiologists. And, uh, and so I think what, well, like what Dr. Ko said, it's better to analyze the city by ourselves. Then we go about it. Thank you. So while we are prepping for the third case, uh, if you have any doubts, you can always ask our faculty. And once the third case goes live, I will come back and uh, present to you about the summary of the case, the radiology, and then go on to the third case. Thank you. Ready, actor.
So we are another 10 minutes to the third case, okay? What's up? One second, one second. We'll set up and we'll just call you. We'll set up and we'll call you. Don't worry. Dinesh? I'm ready when you are. Who camera me repair? Yeah, camera. I think we are ready to go. Yeah, it's screen. If you can brief us about the case, it would be better actually. So we'll just go through the history of the third case. Thank you. Okay. And then after that, I'll run you through radiology. Another two minutes, I believe they're going to induce the patient and get in. So we should have the other view. Check, 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 check. No, 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 So, okay. So, this is a male patient who is 39 years old. So, he presented with uh, generalized weakness, some blurred vision, shortness of breath and loss of weight. So, the comorbid illnesses, he's a hypertensive and uh, he had a retinal detachment, left eye, status post vitrectomy and uh, pars planectomy done in the past. And uh, history of kidney biopsy done in the past uh, proved as membranous nephropathy. A PET CT now shows uh, metabolically active mediastinal lymphadenopathy, but it's in favor of infective image. It's an equivocal SUV uptake. The general physical examination is the patient is conscious, oriented, 95% at room air, saturating, okay. so vitals look stable. Arrow. Arrow. Now these are the initial uh, investigations. So total counts are normal, HP normal, platelet, like I always said, look at your leading parameters, make sure they're all right before you take up for the procedure. So, but, but obviously, the first case, we met with some, uh, you know, uh, bleeding, right? So you have to be prepared for all eventualities while doing any kind of procedures. Creatinine is slightly on the higher side. That itself is an important risk factor for bleeding. Especially chronic kidney disease, the chances of bleeding is higher because of your platelet adhesion issues. So, rest of the things are okay. CRP is normal. So you can, can come closer. You can come closer. Stand here. You come closer because there will be people standing. They will. Go on to the contrast. Is that the contrast? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We're going down. Slow, slow down, Dinesh. 
Uh, we have a big seven lymph node there. What we? So we have a station 7, 10 R, 4 R. Go down, go down. Who can use the scan? Yeah, I think uh, to sum it up, so, I think we have a 40 year old person actually recently having this sort of a kidney issues. Okay. Like we discussed uh, yesterday, we don't know. Okay. So, this is about the media style cut. Run me through the parachute of the piece. Okay. So great. Most of the parenchyma looks clean. Okay. So no parenchymal lesions. We have predominantly lymphadenopathy, most more towards the right. And uh, the lymph nodes are not homogeneous, more or less heterogeneous with some hypoechoic centers. So possibly infective versus inflammation. How many of you will agree? Yeah, so that's a pretext. Okay. So let's see now if we can connect to the OT. Yeah. Uh, able to hear me, what's up? Yeah, yeah, I'm able to hear. Yeah, fine. So the biggest is very clear. I see what we have summarized. Basically, we have a 40 year old person. I don't want to. Recent uh, history of hypertension caused by speaking proteinuria. Subsequently, biopsy to you, you don't insist that I put on the mask. And then subsequently, the PET scan also was done to wrote the release of the media scan. Where there is a borderline media scan link code. SUV of 8.4 is predominantly parrot record and a parahiotic is what they've been commenting on the PET scan. The question is, when there is nephropathy, three most things which need to be working out possibility of an infection. Second, hypercoagulation state by itself. And third is the possibility of a lymphoma is also one more condition which comes up in a case of a membranous nephropathy. So I think that we have ruled out the possibility of a pulmonary embolism with the CT scan so with contrast and I saw not disappointed. Is there any way to elute it in the right hand special? So now possibility of a lymphoma or the info scan. Lymphoma, no doubt, is classically not putting into the picture of lymphoma. But anyhow, biopsy will prove us actually whether it's into any sort of a lymphatic abnormality or in, because of any sort of infection. I think to have, we have a wonderful team actually who lined up here actually for this particular case. I think we, uh, we have Dr. Malay Sharma. I think no, doesn't need any much of an introduction actually. Uh, expert in the ultrasound actually. And also we have uh, Dr. Jeffrey also assisting in the whole process. And with Dr. Arun also here. Now I think uh, Dr. Malay Sharma will go to come up with neurological tricks. How to optimize the image. How to uh, get your maximum resolution on the image. Uh, even what we generate is with the e Predominantly is being working with the project e which will be done in this particular setup. What do you sir? Okay. Am I audible? Am I audible? Am I audible there? Okay. So we see this screen. Once we see this screen right now, there are three things in this screen. I will freeze it. Number one, the frame depth. This screen is having a frame depth. Can I with arrow? Yeah. Frame depth of 15 centimeter. That means the sound wave is going 15 centimeter inside and coming back 15. Second thing, it is having a frame rate. This is the frame rate. 
and third thing it is the same width that we are seeing from here to here we can see more so the sound is now moving 15 cm inside and out for 31 frames per second and now we will see what happens when we put it in water and we decrease change the you will notice that as i change this the frame rate has gone up so the sound velocity that is 1500 meter per second is equal to frame depth into frame width into frame rate but i just want you to understand that when you do it like this more less depth more frame rate more depth fortunately for you people this is never an issue because the frame width of a scope is not a problem number one second thing is now you see concentrate your eyes in this machine just show your hair for a second there is a function tissue harmonic imaging thi so right now thi is on i will shift thi off bring back now you will see the frame rate has doubled to 57. I will switch it on. So right now, what is the difference between tissue harmonic? I will make it dual screen. This is dual screen. This is the tissue harmonic on. Then I will change, I will change the change the screen. And on this screen, I will have the tissue harmonic off. The difference is. The difference is tissue harmonic off. The difference is that on the left side, the frame rate is 28. There the frame rate is 57, double. But in this case, you can see the closer distance very properly. So it doubles the frequency because you are now analyzing the harmonics you are no longer analyzing the fundamental frequency. So what is the fundamental frequency? Right now, if you see, this is the fundamental frequency of 7.5 megahertz that is working. Where is this 7.5 megahertz on the screen? You see it here. The 7.5 megahertz on the screen can be increased the frequency button. Where is the frequency button? I, this is you can you can change the frequency button you can change the frequency to to 13 megahertz 12 megahertz or home so anyway generally we should operate at highest frequency button so i forgot where is the machine in this machine where is the frequency button so now the third thing I want to tell you is gain. Right now you are seeing one thing is focus. Also, when I freeze the machine, you will find that there is a button here. This is the pointer here, focus. I will move this focus up and down. And this focus can be moved up and down. This focus is moving up. This focus is moving down. So this, what is happening when you are moving this focus up and down? You are focusing right now, moving up and down. Focus is the area where the, like a torch, the image concentrate. So I have told you three things, summarize, just freeze it. That whenever you are analyzing, you are analyzing number one, the frame, depth, frame rate, and frame width, which all can be changed. You must analyze at the highest frequency for depth should be three or four centimeter. No need to have 10 centimeter depth and you should apply tissue harmonic imaging. If you want to analyze even better quality of image. Now, the second thing is gain button. Once you put this in water, there are three buttons. Number one is B mode imaging button. I am making it darker. You will see it has become dark. And you will see on the screen here that this is the B mode button. 
this has become very dark. So you can, it has become very light. So you must, there is an auto function in motion machine where you can meet the B cell gain, that is B mode gain. Now, second thing is you switch on the color. This is called now the color button. Once you switch on the color button, again, there is too much of it. What you see is between, there are four characters now. BG is 50. As soon as you have pressed the color button, you will find the BG, you will find CG, that is color gain. And you must adjust the color gain again by decreasing or increasing. I decrease the color gain very much, zero, and then, then I'm increasing the color gain very high. Color, uh, color gain is this, this, this. Yeah, this is the color gain I'm changing. This is the color gain button which I'm changing. So you can change the basal gain, color gain. And the last thing that you must know is that there is a pulse wave Doppler that you apply. So right now you are applying, as soon as you apply pulse wave Doppler, you see this bar appears on the screen. And this is a bar which you can, which you can remove from here, here, here. So this bar, you must learn to apply to identify whether this is an artery or vein. Now, please start. Hello, hi. Can you hear me speak? Hello, hi. Can you hear me? Uh, anyway, we we uh, Dr. Sunil has entered the uh, past the vocal cords into uh the trachea, and uh, he's currently administer administering uh local anesthesia. Currently, we have the patient on a uh, high uh flow oxygenation and uh, conscious sedation. Different uh, from the first case where the patient was under uh, general anesthesia with a laryngeal mask. So, Jeff, uh, can you ask them to put on the endo image, Jeff? Hi, Sri, can you hear me? Uh, we cannot see the endo image. I think I can take over now. So I didn't want to do this part because I'm not so comfortable in entering trachea. But now we have entered trachea. And what I'm telling you is, you must learn to rotate like this or like this. So what we are now seeing is that now we are seeing the, at the lower end. Are we at the lower end? Not yet. Okay, I'm this is the carina, to... I believe. So uh, now yeah. in the yeah. carina, one thing is on your right, one thing is on your left. If I move to the right like this, and I move my probe up, I will see the vena cava. Right and up. If I move to the left, one minute, and yeah, I move you... up. Ah, yeah. Now, one thing is, I am more than 25 centimeters down. So I'm just pulling it back just to confirm whether I have not entered into a bronchus. So, but because I don't have a good marker, ah. so I may have been into a bronchus or not. You're quite high up in the check. Hmm? You're quite high up in the check. Yeah. Now I'm quite. Yeah. So, uh, it, uh, you, you so I was told by the expert I'm quite high. So I will remain high. You, you go in, you see the. I will remain. Just about one to two centimeter above carina. Now what to do? I will turn either like this, move up, or like this and move up. And I look like this and move up. I expect to see the arch of aorta. When I see and do move up, I expect to see the superior vena cava. And then I will start tracing. So the easier thing to do is sometimes to go into the right bronchus because there the bronchus narrows down and you will invariably see 
the structure that you want to see. So I will just go into the bronchus. Now, what will you see? Anterior to bronchus. This is the anterior part. What will you see? Posterior to the right bronchus. This is the posterior wall of the right bronchus. This is the anterior wall. So what should we be seeing? Just anterior to this part, I expect to see crossing the right bronchus, the right pulmonary artery. So now I'm here, I will move it up and then I will just keep it like this. And right now I will show you, ask you to see on the hand that this, whatever I'm seeing is the right pulmonary artery. Right now we are seeing at very high maximum grain. And so this is, so okay, this so is this the is right the pulmonary artery. Pentax system. Okay. Which so we are seeing. I will just move it. And below the, the right pulmonary artery, whatever I am seeing is the left atrium. So can somebody hold it because I am slipping out? I am not able to. So yes. concentrate on this. For now I am seeing here. This just hold it. Just hold that code. So I am keeping it up. So what do you see beyond the right pulmonary artery? First, let me change the depth in such a way that I am seeing more structure. Then I will tell you what should we be seeing in front of the right pulmonary artery. Now this is the right pulmonary artery. When you see the anatomy in diagram, in front of right pulmonary artery, you expect to see two structures. One is ascending aorta and one is inferior vena cava. But first, let us finish off that right now we are seeing is the right pulmonary artery or not. How will we do that? I will apply a pulse Doppler on this. I will bring this inside this. I will keep the le sample length. This is the sample length to less than the diameter and I will update it. And you will find these are the pulsations of the right pulmonary artery. I will move this box now to this part and then see what does the part is, what happens that the screen was frozen. So I will now come remove this again the pulse Doppler again, and I will come back and I will now see as I'm moving, you see the right pulmonary artery is, seems to be coming from here. This is the coming. What is happening? See, this part is the pulmonary trunk because the right pulmonary artery comes up and crosses to the right. The course of right pulmonary artery is longer than that of the left. The left pulmonary artery is shorter. Right pulmonary artery is longer, about 3.5 centimeter length. And you can probably measure that this is the place where this right pulmonary artery is around 5 centimeter of length. So where is the pulmonary wall? Pulmonary wall will be about 2 centimeters. So remember, when you are seeing the right pulmonary artery here, what are the structures that you are seeing beyond the right pulmonary artery? So you are seeing something within the right pulmonary artery. And if I show you the practical use, the, within the right pulmonary artery, you are seeing some, something flapping. What is that flapping? Let me apply for a second the tissue harmonic imaging and you will see that flap is gone. So that was an artifact and that has gone, but I will now come back. So this is an artifact because the ingoing information is no longer analyzed. Okay. Now we are seeing this pulsatile structure. What is this pulsatile structure? How do we identify? It? Again, do not apply color. Apply again a pulse, rotate, keep it like this, and then apply again, not, not the elastography. I will apply the pulse Doppler again on this. Let us see. I have got good postcards on the screen and I will update it, and then I will see what it is. So I don't see very high pulsation. So could it be the inferior vena cava? The only thing is I have to analyze it in this direction, a little bit oblique, and not because at that time, my pulsations were at right angle, and the principle of color Doppler or power Doppler imaging is, you should not be at a right angle to the vessel. So this is now we have seen, that I am a little bit confused whether this is superior vena cava or whether this is ascending aorta. Okay. But we will see. Now, what do we do? As I said, we will remove the pulse Doppler again. And we will now sweep, uh, sorry, again, 
and then oh sorry yeah. we remove it and then we will come back to this so what do i do if whether this is supiya vina keva or not i will keep on concentrating on it and pull it back i will see only this nothing else only this and only this and only this and see this is this is the ascending aorta because right now what you see beyond is the left brachiocephalic vein do you why the left brachios and from the can you change the depth a little bit higher more more depth no 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 the other one and this one yeah rotate other way other way so right now no no 6 cm no 4 cm 4 cm yeah yeah so what you are seeing so right now i am seeing the as ascending aorta has become converted into the arch of aorta so now i will rotate this to this side this ascending aorta will convert into descending aorta and i will push it back this will become the ascent why it is arch of aorta because from the top border of this artery we are seeing the origin of the vessels and in front of the vessels the typical left subclavian vein is there so can you bring pulse doppler to this subclavian vein pw 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 and bring the this to this subclavian vein and decrease the sample length decrease the sample length because the sample length is 3.5 mm i want you to decrease it a little bit and right now what we are seeing is that there are some lot of lot of bubbles which are coming in is the patient having some sort of a internal jugular vein catheter or where is or who is giving the anesthesia you are giving in the jugular vein or you are giving in the peripheral peripheral okay so then i will show you how so this is now updated please can you update it so this is now the left brachiocephalic vein because it crosses in front of the all three vessels okay can you remove the pulse or not go back so now we are seeing now we are yeah. remove the ah, okay so what we now need to do is change the depth once more more depth i want here yeah. okay now i want to show so this is the left brachiocephalic vein and now i will pull back a little bit keeping and i will rotate this brachiocephalic vein clockwise and you will see this brachiocephalic vein will merge with the right brachiocephalic vein and then they will form the supiya vena cava what is the problem now as i rotate the tracheal rings are troubling me as i come higher up the tracheal rings will intermittently make my vision bit difficult but i will try to go between the tracheal ring and push in and out see here the tracheal ring is coming rotate maybe little bit push in and out and then follow this by clockwise rotation whether i can follow this into the supiya vena cava or not now this is the i will now rotate this ascending aorta to the left wise and try to because upper part the tracheal ring examination makes my difficult and this difficult even i am rotating it to the left and rotating and this what we are seeing now is the descending aorta not only you see the descending aorta you see the pleura on the left side and you will see the mirror image of the descending aorta and apply color doppler you will find two two aorta color color, color not power, color you will find two aorta and you increase the size of the color box how do you increase the size of the color box you take it to this side make it and then you make it so you will find descending right now you will see that the color gain is too much so what we will do is we will decrease the color gain color gain and i lost the so this is so this is the now uh, remove the okay now this is a beautiful picture right now what we are seeing this is the arch of aorta so i am again pulling back and i once i have pulled back here the arch of aorta i i will decrease the color gain even further what i am seeing below the arch of aorta is the left pulmonary artery because this is the typical mickey mouse sign where i move it a little bit more and in between the two arch of aorta and the left pulmonary artery you will find the mickey mouse the again problem is 
because the tracheal ring, I cannot, I can show you now as I rotate to left, this will become the descending aorta. As I rotate to the right, this art of aorta and I pull back, will have three vessels going from the top. The first will be the brachiocephalic trunk. And in front of the brachiocephalic trunk, you will find the left brachiocephalic vein and the carotid, uh, uh, and the left common carotid artery. If it's the same place, you can continue rotation. You will find the left common carotid artery will go, then will, uh, sorry, left brachiocephalic, uh, left subclavian, then the left common carotid will come. And then the, the, uh, a brachiocephalic trunk will come. The reason we are not seeing again is the trachea, but if there was a lymph node at this place, you would have been able to see. So we have followed the uh, aorta to the arch of aorta. Can you remove the color, please? We now, we now know that this is not, this is now the arch of aorta, and we have learned to see beyond the arch of aorta, the, uh, this is, this, now you see, this is, right pulmonary artery. And this is the pulmonary transverse part of the right pulmonary artery. And when you rotate it to the left more, you see here, you move up knob up, you will see the left pulmonary artery. So the arch of aorta climbs up. The pulmonary artery remains at the same level, approximately 25 centimeter. I am at 30 centimeter. So we have analyzed the pulmonary arteries now let us go and analyze the pulmonary veins. For analyzing the pulmonary veins, we must go enter into one of the bronchuses and then. So I have to again pull back the scope and see where I am. I am in the, and then this is the. Here will be the carina here. Uh, this is, is the, the left. This uh, is the left. You should turn the scope immediately and put it up. So this is. So I have now entered into the right bronchus. Now, once you enter into the right bronchus, you go, this, what do you think this is? Right now, whatever you are seeing, can anybody image? What will I find when I go into the right bronchus and I turn to the right? What is this vest? It is Ajayva. And it is arching posterior to the right bronchus to join the Supiya Vina Keva. So now let me follow this Ajayva vein by pulling it a little bit up, and I will find this Ajaygos vein will go into the Supiya Vina Keva. This is this. And once it goes into the Supiya Vina Keva, yes, yeah, this is the Supiya Vina Keva just beyond. And the what you see, this is Supiya Vina Keva, is the pulsatile structure that you are seeing here. Pulsatile. But why Supiya Vina Keva is pulsatile? Because it changes the caliber. Can you? So I will again lock it. And this, the Jaigos vein will be joining the Supiya Vina Keva. Now somehow I have entered into the, or more deeper into the right bronchus. So I will change the depth a little bit more. Can you please change the depth? Okay. And right now, what, what do you see now? So this is called the four-chambered view of the heart. Four-chambered view, whatever you are seeing now is the left atrium, which is anterior to the right, right bronchus. Left atrium, and there is an interatrial septum. What I will do is just rotate. Now, can I request the, this left atrium is now converting into the left ventricle, and just where my arrow is, that is the beating left mitral valve. So I will rotate it a little bit like this, and this is the interatrial septum. Inter I will request now the anesthetist if they can give two ml of saline, two ml of saline, one ml of air, agitate it, then remove the air, remove the air, and then inject the saline so that I can demonstrate to you people to what is happening into the right atrium. Because this is the right atrium just beyond. So 2 ml saline, 1 ml air, shake it, make some bubbles in it, then remove the air.
what you have more shadow. Godwati, can we move the arrow below and more depth? I want a little bit more depth. And you must understand. Uh, peripheral line, have you shaken it? No, no. Done? Okay, now immediately flush it. Immediately. And you will see that these air bubbles will appear within the... The only thing, this is the long tubing where they may appear, they may not appear. But this is one of the techniques to detect hepatopulmonary syndrome if they appear here. But this is where I expect them to appear. And what, maybe I will decrease the frequency, frequency to see. Yeah, 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 you see, yeah. You, it, the blood is flowing to the peripheral vein. Yeah, this is the place where they will come. Okay, but anyway, so I have told you way I can more easily demonstrate if I am more. So now I have told you how to. Now this is the left atrium. What you do is you rotate this left atrium to left, and you will find that this will convert into inferior and superior pulmonary vein, and you rotate it to the right, it will convert into right inferior and right superior pulmonary. So this is now we are seeing when you are seeing the left atrium. You pull it just above, slightly higher, and this is where you expect the lymph node of subcarnal area to be between the left atrium and pulmonary artery. So right now, can you freeze the structure? Freeze. Freeze. Stop. So right now, what we are seeing is the left atrium here, the pulmonary artery here, and the superior vena cava here. And remove the free. Okay. So this is what I have shown from the uh, left side. Now, right side. Now I will probably go into the left bronchus once more. This is the last part of this into the left bronchus. Once I go into the left bronchus, you, I am in the left? Yes, sir. Okay. Again, so there is some cuffs. So we need some gylocaine pullback. Gylocaine. We need some, no, no, gylocaine here into the channel. And when we gylocaine into the channel, so what do you expect? Whatever structures you have seen from the right bronchus anterior, you will see from the left bronchus also. Gylocaine or no, you said it, okay. So I will go in into the left bronchus, okay. I will now go into the left. This is the left, okay? Yep. Okay. I am doing EBUS after maybe two years or three years. Okay, so now I entered into into the left bronchus. Point scope medial Upper with the left bronchus? Yes, yes. Okay. Move it up. Yes, yes. Push it in. Yes. Yeah. So for some reason, I'm not able to go much deeper. But anyway, we'll see what we see here. So again, I think so. what I will tell you is that from the left bronchus, you will see the same structure that you see from the right bronchus. So can you uh, get into deeper into left bronchus if possible? You are there. I think. Yeah. I think this is okay. So we are in the left bronchus. Once you enter into the left bronchus, you turn clockwise a little bit, and then you will see the same structure that you are seeing. Can you go to the end uh, of Ibas. Ibas. That is screen should show Ibas. Now the again the same structure. The chamber that will be closest to you would be the left atrium and this is the left atrium and the chamber you will this you pulling back change the depth please change the depth more depth 
I want 10 centimeter, 10 centimeter. No, no, this is more depth. I will pull back more. Yes. And I will now decrease the frequency, please. High frequency, we want it lowest frequency. Okay. Now here is examination. The chamber which is closest to you is the left atrium. And you will see an interatrial septum. Can we repeat the experiment again with the air bubble, please? Now, just a little bit here, you will find a buttock sign and a clapping sign. Whatever valves you are seeing, somebody, this is the clapping sign. So what I will do, what is the clap, what is clapping? The mitral valve is clapping. And this is the buttock sign. This is the buttock sign. The clap is there, but this aortic wall looks like a buttock, the lying buttock. And within this, there is a clap. Sorry? Which one? Yeah, we will try no out. So now we are seeing three walls. Number one, we are seeing the tricuspid wall. We are seeing the aortic wall and we are seeing the mitral wall. Below is the tricuspid wall. Below. This is the tricuspid wall. And this is. So now I will rotate and see more. Can, can you now put in the, this is the interatrix. Bubbles, please. These bubbles will come here. Yeah. Yeah. Move the focus down. Focus down. This is where I expect the bubbles to appear. Yes. This is the bubble. So now once you follow these bubbles, they will they appear in the atrium, right atrium. Follow these bubbles, they will go into the right ventricle. And, the tri and then from the right ventricle, you can follow up. This is the pulmonary trunk, upper up. This is the pulmonary trunk that is coming higher up. This is the pulmonary trunk. So take small target, short target. What will you see from left bronchus? What will you see from right bronchus? What will you see anterior to left bronchus? What will you see posterior to left bronchus? So posterior to left bronchus, you will see the descending aorta once more. This is the descending aorta. And I must learn to follow the descending aorta all the way back along, along the, all the, all, I'm pulling back, pulling back, pulling only one. In between, it will disappear because of trickle. And I will follow it back, follow it back, rotating, keep on rotating. Yeah, yeah. till it becomes the arch of aorta. Now I am seeing three vessels, pulmonary artery left, Descending aorta becoming arch of aorta and the left brachiocephalic vein. So because the tracheal rings are interfering, this is, this is the left brachiocephalic vein. Okay. So I think I am done. Hmm? Ah, yeah, please. No, this is relevant because you need to see the lymph node where they lie. Where the lymph nodes are enlarged. Right now, because you have done EBUS, you take FNAC, esophagus examination will be very convenient. And uh, if time permits, once it finishes of the FNAC, then I will show you it from the esophagus. Uh, so after uh, uh, Street, you can hear me. Eh? So after uh, uh, Dr. Sh Sharma has uh, so detailedly showed us uh, the anatomy, uh, e even from uh, trachea, EBUS uh, scope, uh, now Dr. Sunil is going to uh, sample, look for, visualize uh, for our lymph node. 
uh, free trachea and then uh, we're going to try to sample uh, that lymph node. Increase the depth. So you can see the lymph node, uh, it's likely to be a very small size. Yeah. Do you want me to measure it? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, we've managed to measure the the lymph lymph node. Uh, zero point six six cm. So it's a six point six mm. So it's just slightly uh above uh five mm. Yeah, so, so this is a standard, uh, quite standard uh, for our view of a lymph node. Uh, you, you can see uh, the lymph node here. Uh, we have decreased the depth, so therefore it looks bigger. But on measurement, it's a 6.6 .6, uh, uh, mm size lymph node. And uh, below, when you when the color Doppler lights up, is the superior vena cover. A very standard uh, for our uh, lymph node picture on the ultrasound. Yeah. 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 It's, it's almost inside. You just need to jiggle it a little. Yeah. So you can see the needle is gone into the lymph node. Uh, and and uh, Dr. Sunil has uh, skillfully agitated, managed to agitate the needle uh, within this uh, lymph node, which is uh, just above 5 mm in size. Uh, we're being very careful here, uh, turning on uh, the, the, the color flow so that uh, we can visualize any blood vessels. Uh, I think uh, uh, Dr. Sh Dr. Sunil uh, might try to fan it a little uh, so that we can get uh, specimens from different parts of the lymph node. Uh, there's no blood seen on the string uh, so far. When you see the lymph node, when you go for an initial sample, do you think that second pass will be better than the first pass actually? Because hyperemia, what we generally tend to see, once you go for the first pass, the second pass will be much better than it on an artifact. Uh, I, I find it uh, very variable uh, because 
uh, the first pass can be less bloody than the second pass. Uh, so, so it can be quite variable. I don't, I don't uh, think that uh, anything like, uh, you know, the first pass has to be done by a senior doctor and therefore uh, you get a better you uh, first pass is done by a training doctor. So uh, I, I, I think it, it can be quite variable because uh, the lymph node characteristics are different. The patient is different. Uh, the needles used are different because now uh, we're using a Mediglobe uh, needle, which uh, I've never used before. I'm uh, uh, using Olympus and uh, Boston Scientific needles. Uh, so, so I think there are, there are a lot of uh, other factors that can, that can uh, affect uh, whether you get uh, adequate sample or whether you get ill. So Dr. Sunil is going to attempt a, a second pass. Uh, okay, so the needle has uh, punctured the wall. We're looking for it on the ultrasound image. I believe it's, uh, the tip is somewhere here. Yes, yeah. And we're doing this under color. Yeah, you can clearly see the needle now. It's agitating within the lymph node. No, only the protein is the only need of the only the protein of the only protein that is the only thing is there. When when you try to fan to increase uh you uh you you just adjust your liver. Uh, liver, either thumb up or liver up or liver push down the liver. Uh, you are uh, advised not to and against uh, turning your scope to the left or the right because uh, when people have done that, uh, they actually break the needle before. So then the needle gets stuck in the uh, bronchial wall, which is not. Uh, yeah, okay. So, so uh, you, you don't want the needle to be stuck in a tracheal wall. And uh, we have uh, removed the needle from uh, the the EBA scope. Dr. Sunil has uh, gone into the esophagus, uh, esophagus, has gone into eso has has gone into the the esophagus, uh, has gone into the esophagus uh, with the scope. Uh, I I'm audible? Okay. Now here is where if you keep it just like this, you will see this is the left atrium. This is the clapping sign of mitral wall and this is the left ventricle. So this is the, I will freeze it and just move it. So if you, this is, and this is the wall that you see wall of the left ventricle which is thicker from this position if you pull a little bit back 
this is the coronary artery and you will see it that it will go into the root of lung or root of aorta which will emerge from this part so you rotate slightly clockwise and this is the buttock lying buttock like this with a clapping within the buttock and within from this cusp if you rotate you will see the coronary artery coming one here and one there i am just want to now concentrate that this upper border the left atrium is the lower boundary of subcarinal space and the pulmonary artery that you are seeing here is included in subcarinal space it is not part of subcarinal so the question is right now then you see this descending aorta how old is the man 48 so do i see this wall which is coming an atherosclerotic wall in the ascending aorta just rotate it a little bit or i see something because i see something within this i will try and see if if by uh, applying tissue harmonic this becomes clear and it has become clear that is the point the only problem is once you apply tissue harmonic you will not be able to see the deeper structure so well okay so we have now seen the right pulmonary artery and the reason you are not able to have good visibility is that you are not sucking so don't switch off the air with your okay just suck and move a little bit up so that you can touch into the esophagus push the scope a little bit inside and you will see that this is now the pulmonary artery if you rotate this pulmonary artery to the left this is now the falling pulmonary artery that rotate back this is rotate slightly back yes yes so this is the same thing that i have shown you that this is the pulmonary trunk and you can trace this within this you will find somewhere here the pulmonary wall to so push it in this this and this will lead you into the right ventricle this is the right ventricle so now push it a little bit more in and in this position same position you will find concentrate on this don't lose that this you see the left atrium left ventricle from the left ventricle left ventricular outflow tract into the art aortic wall and interventricular septum here and the right ventricle and somewhere here you will expect the pulmonary wall and this is the pulmonary trunk can we repeat the experiment again of the air bubble because these air bubble will appear into the right ventricle and they will move up all the way into the pulmonary trunk but focus rotate not this yes more yes little bit more you can see now the clapping sign very smile you can see the buttock sign and you can again find this the bubbles will come here this this and this is the tricuspid valve that you see here this is the tricuspid valve here so bubbles will come into this part and then they will go from this part into the pulmonary trunk and so how to identify so now you can see the tricuspid valve much better so here we are waiting for the bubbles to appear and this they have appeared here this is appearing here they will go into this part and then you follow it rotate a little bit the other way gradually you will learn how to follow we do this experiment each case do the experiment and within five cases you will know what is what okay now this is the left atrium that you are seeing now close to you and remember do not confuse this floppy structure as mitral valve 
because this is the interatrial septum. Okay, we are waiting. We are waiting for the bubbles now. Are we ready? Yes, ready. The only thing is it should be done immediately. And because the bubbles generally disappear if you take a long time in connecting it to. Flushed. Yeah, this is they are here. Now they are here. And you see they are coming from Supia Vina Keva. Or in Pia Vina Keva. This is in the yeah, they are coming from the Supia Vina Keva. You will see the bubbles coming from the Supia. This is Supia Vina Keva. This is in Pia Vina Keva. So the devil bubbles will come and a rush from superior vena keva. Now I want you to just follow the inferior vena keva into the liver. Please push the scope inside, more inside, and you will see the inferior vena keva going into the liver. And this is the wall, eustachian wall, and this structure which is appearing here now is the liver, and this is the diaphragm. You will see this is the inferior vena keva. Just a brief, I want you to push it a little bit more inside, rotate the scope. And now this is the rotate the scope clockwise, right? And you will see this is the this is the hepatic vein that is joining the inferior vena keva. So you must learn at least. If you can rotate the scope more to the left, you will see the left lobe. You can rotate the scope more to the right, push it in, push it in. Push it more in, more in, more in. Now, how to find the adrenal gland? Since you have put in right now, you rotate it a little bit more clockwise and you will find the aorta more rotate, more rotate, keep on rotating. Yes, this is the aorta. Once you see the aorta, I want to show you that this aorta lies in front of the spine. And this is this, just rotate a little bit this, yeah, this, this is the, one spine is about 2 to 2.5 centimeters length, and in between the spine, you are finding the intervertebral disc. Once you have identified the aorta, you push it a little bit more inside, and from the front of aorta, you will find rotate a little bit to left and right. You will find clockwise that this will, artery will come and merge into the aorta. Again, rotate back, please, please rotate back. And I want you to please understand that this structure that you see here right now is the adrenal gland. And you will see this, just keep it like this, just keep it like this. So what I do not see is you will see a flying bird. The flying bird that you are seeing, but remember now, I will compare this image because this is a frozen. And then I will remember. Now I will do is, I will show you the effect of increasing the frequency and this increasing the frequency is now I'll go to high frequency. I will show you the effect of applying tissue harmonic imaging. And then I want you to compare that this is the, this is the adrenal gland here and this is that. The adrenal gland is crossed in front by the splenic artery so this I will outline, 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 uh, no, out, I want to see this is the outline here, I will make another outline here, then I will make another outline, this is here, and then this is the adrenal gland. This will be the lower cornua, and then generally you can trace it from here. So I will come back again. Now, now find the adrenal gland, finish it off. Now learn four relationship of adrenal gland. I will put, because you will, you must go use this scope is fantastic for adrenal gland. Number one, highest frequency 
adrenal gland is crossed in front by left uh, splenic vein and splenic artery you can zoom it even further and learn now the four relationship of adrenal gland so what are the four relationship rotate and find the back gland back yes can you see the seagull the flying seagull so the flying seagull has got four relationship yes so you need can you move just a little bit up now yes that is that is the flying seagull comes beautifully push it in a little bit misko now rotate a little bit yes so this is the flying seagull that you see can how you can you move it back na roll back roll back go back sir oh. yeah. yeah this is this is so this is the flying seagull now learn two limb four relationship this is the upper limb this is the lower limb and this is the body of the adrenal gland this is the upper limb of adrenal gland and this is the black is the cortex white is the medulla anterior to upper limb lies the stomach posterior to upper limb lies the crux of diaphragm anterior to lower limb lies the pancreas and posterior to lower limb this is the kidney now see can you show the audience all four structure now this now what you will see here this is the area of crux of diaphragm aorta crux of diaphragm adrenal gland and remember adrenal gland will be crossed in front by two dots and these two dots vessels are splenic artery and splenic vein so i will apply color doppler and apply pulse doppler to show you that this is splenic artery how can you say this is splenic artery because it is showing many colors what is the meaning of many color right now if you see the bar on the side this bar on the side this means the velocity positive side and negative side you are picking up on the range of 12 so what i can do is i can change the velocity velocity and i can make it 19 once i change the velocity to 19 you will see only one color i will change the size of the okay uh, okay uh, i think uh, we we will uh, have to uh, we ran out of time i think we will get one or two minutes for dr sharma to wrap up for us okay so now i think this is over so i have shown you three imaging b mode imaging color imaging and last is the pulse doppler imaging to see this within this whatever time update it because this is venous signal that you need see and this is arterial signal that you see okay, okay uh, i think uh, we got to thank uh, dr sharma for his uh, very detailed uh, delineation of the mediastinal anatomy from from for us uh, including uh, imaging of the heart uh, the valves and the structures yeah. can you wait wait just just one second can can you push once okay thank you dr sharma yeah. thank Welcome. you thank you uh well well i think uh in this uh session we have uh, demonstrated uh, the basics of uh, ebus combined with uh, eusd uh uh you know, and uh we we have uh, gone through okay, uh, how to do not control for ultrasound based on the area adrenal dikhni aa gayi adrenal dikhni aa gayi and uh so we'll conclude this session uh, for now thank you very much everybody we should know beyond what we want to see <laughs> yeah. because uh, unless and until we know structures all around and beyond what we want to see yes. that is the spirit uh, able to discuss yes. what is shown anything any questions i'll have dr sharma dr jeffrey answer your doubts if you have any doubts
So this is a slide I intentionally projected to basically differentiate what the US can reach and what the E plus can reach. So very clearly, the black and red are the ones that the E plus can reach. And the one with the oblique lines and black patch are the ones the US above can. Right? And then there is an overlap at the black region where both the things can reach. So most of the time, you should understand that the US is left for you, right? The right nodes are a bit difficult. So if you have four R, very difficult for the US to reach the US. Of course, the adrenal gland only can reach with the EU. Okay, so I want all of you guys to be seated here. So we'll have all our faculty come in in five minutes. So we have some very important thing to do for the day with all our faculty here. Okay, so we're going to honor our faculty who have taught you already and who are going to teach you in the workshop after the lunch. So just to inform you how the workshop works, so that all of you are aware and prepared for it mentally. So there's enough time to rest now till lunch. And after that, we have the workstations where you guys will be divided as per the color code that is given in the ID card. So if you look at your ID card, it's all color coded, right? So I'll mention which color code goes to which workstation accordingly, right? And once you go to the workstation, you will have a questions asked to you and an activity given to you to perform on the simulator or the dummy. Okay, so this is just a pretest, just to know whether whatever we have done over the last one and a half days, you have understood it, whether you were able to assimilate that information and how you will bring it to practical knowledge. Now, suppose you are unable to do it, don't worry. We are all students, we are all on the learning curve. Nothing to worry, the faculty will immediately demonstrate I have certain experts assigned to each of these workstations who will demonstrate how to do the particular maneuver or reach that particular lymph node or whatever it is, the activity. Once that is done, all of you there must concentrate because post that session, you will be given a post-test questionnaire, which roughly has around 10 questions and an MCQ type. I want you to tick it off with your name written very clearly and which college you're, or which institute you're from and your KMC number or your uh, you know registration number so that we can counter check later. So once you go through all the four stations, most likely two stations out of four stations, you should be able to pass. It's a very basic requirement at the end of this exhaustive course, right? That's called. So, and then we will certify you, all of you, with all these expert signatures on the certificate through the end of the day. So when I say end of the day, roughly we're looking at an exit from this place by 5.30 PM or six. Okay, is that okay with all of you? Most of you, okay. And in between, if there is any issues with regards to collecting your certificate early because you have an early you know, flight booked or this one, come to me personally or Dr. Sunil and let me know so that we can help you accordingly, right? So that's about that. And uh, so I just want all of you to be seated here for a couple of minutes more until we have all our faculty from the OT come back in so that we can start the, uh, we can honor our faculty first. And then we have a photo session, very important, isn't it? And then we go on to other activities subsequently, right? Anything else you want to ask me? Right. Thank you.
A very good afternoon, dear doctors. Hope you all had an amazing time with us so far. I, Dr. Namrata Raj, would like to take this opportunity to express our immense gratitude and honor to all our esteemed faculty on behalf of our team, Interventional Pulmonology, as to CMI Hospital, Bangalore, for making time for us, for teaching us, and for making this event so pleasantly memorable for us. I request Dr. Sunil Kumar, to kindly present our esteemed faculty with a memento as an expression of her gratitude and honor, please. First, I would like to request Dr. Jeffrey to come onto the stage, please. Okay, uh, could I please have Dr. Aravindran on stage? Thank you, sir. Next, I would like to invite Dr. Shazang, physician and pulmonologist, Savak General Hospital, Malaysia. Next. Please, I would like to invite Dr. Harikishan Gonuguntla, Lead Consultant, Intervention Pulmonology, Program Director, Yashoda Hospital, Hyderabad. I invite Dr. Tinku Joseph, Associate Professor, Chief of Interventional Pulmonology, Department of Pulmonary Medicine, School of Medicine, Cochin. I humbly request Dr. Malay Sharma, Consultant Gastroenterologist, Hepatologist, and Head of Endoscopy, Mirror. I invite Dr. Binil Salman, Interventional Pulmonology, MBR Cancer Center and Research Institute, Kori Code, Kerala. Uh, 
Finally, I would like to invite Dr. Deepak TH, Consultant Interventional Pulmonologist, Kowai Medical Center and Hospital, Coimbatore. Thank you, Dr. Sunil. I would request Dr. Watsa to come on to stage to kindly present the respected faculty. Um, I would like to invite Dr. Narathan, consultant pulmonologist, Nivin Lung Care and Hospital, Tendogin. Could I please invite Dr. Kedar Hibare? If he's present. Okay, sir. May I please invite Dr. Vishnu G. Krishnan, specialist. Okay. Next, I would like to invite Dr. Shivalanga Sami, consultant pulmonologist, Trustwell Hospital, Bangalore. Thank you, sir. I invite Dr. Preeti Vidya Sagar, Interventional Pulmonologist, Yashoda Hospital, Hyderabad. Thank you, sir. I invite Dr. MD Varun, Consultant, Interventional Pulmonology, PSG Hospital, Coimbatore, Tamil Nadu. Requesting Dr. Pradeep VI, Consultant Interventional Pulmonology, People Tree Hospital, Bangalore. Thank you, sir. Next, I would like to invite Dr. V. Arun, Lead Consultant, Anesthesia, Asta CMI Hospital, Bangalore. Okay, so may I invite Dr. Vidya MN, lead consultant, histopathology. Okay, finally, I would like to invite Dr. Tyagesha Deva Ganapati, MD, fellowship in interventional pulmonology, consultant, interventional pulmonologist, Cancer Institute, Chennai. Thank you very much, sir. Okay, today is a very. Okay, so today is a very special day for us, not only because it happens to be a workshop day, but also because it happens to be one of our most respected doctor's birthday. Dear Dr. Tinku, <laughs> wishing you the happiest birthday yet. We have a tiny surprise for you and we hope you like it. Requesting you to kindly join us on the dais and celebrate your birthday with us. I'm sure you guys are gonna join us to sing a happy birthday song for Dr. Tinko, right?
May I please invite Dr. Tripti onto the dais, please? Thank you, doctor, for all your efforts and for helping us too. Um, on the first, I would welcome, uh, I'd like to welcome all the delegates. And uh, I saw the how the workshop was going and I think it's a big success because everyone was, you know, showing so much interest and the way all of you have explained how to go through all these procedures. So uh, thank you so much. And I hope uh, from the pathology point of view, I've tried to uh, cover up all the things. And if anything is left, please uh, let me know. I'd be happy to answer all the questions in post lunch session. Thank you. Dr. Tripri, consultant pathologist, Aster Reference Lab, Aster CMI, Bangalore. Thank you. So now we have done with all the initial celebration. There's still more celebration ahead. So what I thought was to motivate both the faculty as well as the students to give their best during the workshop. So I have two good prizes, one for the faculty. And it was the fag end of the two days to put in their efforts best to teach you guys at the workstation. And on the post test, the student who gets the highest score, it's a rough score, but who gets the highest score again wins a prize, which we, should, we will distribute at around 5.30 or 6 p.m. when we are ending the day. So I hope that of all the information you have assimilated over the next, over the last two days, you put it to use during your workshop and give it your best. And hopefully we see uh, winners at the end of the day. And I hope that all of you are winners. And that's the intention of this whole uh, two-day conference. Thank you. I invite Dr. Jeffrey on stage, Senior Consultant and Clinical Director, Division of Respiratory and Critical Care Medicine Department, National University Hospital, Singapore, to kindly receive a memento. Thank you, Dr. Jeffrey. One last, uh, you know, housekeeping thing uh, that's uh, after the uh, lunch. So we give you one hour lunch break so that you can cool down a bit. After that, uh, the red group, red group, those who have ID cards with red on it will go to the first workstation. Okay. So our staff are there to guide you and the orange group will go to the second workstation. The blue group will go to the third workstation and the green group goes to the fourth workstation. Okay, so the first workstation is linear EBUS anatomy. Second workstation is linear EBUS technical aspects. Third workstation is about radial EBUS and the fourth workstation is exciting is about pathology. So you'll learn how to see slides on the fourth workstation. We have one more offbeat workstation, which is about cryo. So that workstation, once you finish all the other workstations, come down and see that workstation where Dr. Hari or any of our faculty will be happy to tell you how the cryoprobe works and uh, how you take a biopsy either with a guide sheet or through the lymph node. Okay. Right. Thank you. You can disperse for lunch. Oh, yeah.
Thank <laughs> you. 